Hello and welcome everybody to the Nausicast. The Nausicast is where we went through each movie made by Studio Ghibli and we shared our analysis and research findings. However, you may have noticed that we've run out of movies made by Studio Ghibli, which is, you know, why from now and into the future, this little slogan at the beginning of our podcast will be replaced by something. This time it was only a gag, but going forward, at least for now, our plan is to cover other movies made by Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata, especially before they made Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. And, you know, after we finished covering all of these pre-Ghibli movies, uh, the first of which we will be starting with today, we will also continue in other directions afterwards. Stay tuned for that. Um, of course, we're also planning to cover the possibly final Ghibli movie to ever come out, uh, that will be How Do You Live, which is slated to release in Japan in a couple of weeks, but there is no Western release date as of yet. Where we've discussed a little bit how we want to cover How Do You Live when it does come out. Um, we kind of fell on thinking that once we've all seen it in the theaters, we're going to have a first impressions episode and probably give it a more thorough, more researched and more close reading kind of take once there's a home video release of some kind or variety, like hopefully a Blu-ray. Um, Aside from that, let's get right into it, what we're going to talk about now, which is a movie called Horos, Prince of the Sun, released in 1968. But more on the movie after I introduce my fellow hosts, because with me today is Platon Skull. Hey there, uh, happy to be here for the first episode of uh, Ghibli Origins, the prequel. Episode zero. <laughs> episode minus five. And we have Hipster Cthulhu. It's me uh, here again. Uh, he, him. I remembered. I don't think Platon did. Yeah, Platon didn't remember. Um, yeah, dawn, dawn of a new era for us, uh, but I'm still tired as ever. Tired? <laughs> you won't believe how tired I am, but let's go. Let's go. Oh, oh geez. Oh, geez. Okay. I'm your host, Nyard. Uh, I'm also he, him, and, uh, you know, let's just get right into it. So, 1968, we're traveling really far into the past. Uh, a time, I think that's, yeah, that's the year my father was born, just so we get a sense of how much time, you know, is between that and now. Um, this year, 1968, is when uh, Horus Prince of the Sun comes out after a three-year uh, production process, which, you know, really drained the resources over at Toy Doga, which was the studio that both Takahata and Miyazaki were working for at the time. And it would be the movie that starts their 50-year uh, cooperation, you know, starting there, maybe a, a little bit earlier even, we'll get into that, uh, leading them all the way to founding Studio Ghibli uh, about 15 years later and the long history of Studio Ghibli we've discussed coming after this. So this is a pretty historically important movie for us to be covering in this podcast. Uh, I believe this is also uh, a point in their careers in which they were heavily based in like union activity because they were both working at Toei at the time and they were both involved in the uh, trade union. Yeah, he and, heavily uh, based is, is right. Yeah, yeah, based. Um, <laughs> uh, because just a little historical kind of background, the 60s was like a really politically turbulent time for Japan. There was a, um, a big amount of like student protests and just protests in general against the um, continuation of the Japanese government's agreements with America, but also just a lot of other, you know, social issues and stuff that were coming about. So Miyazaki himself and I think Takahata were involved in a lot of like union and labor protests and this is how they really got to know each other and got, you know, working together on a consistent basis. Yeah, uh, Miyazaki was, was in fact, uh, I, I believe, like uh, secretary of the Toei Animation Union, um, which uh, like which which fits pretty well. He he, he got some uh, like uh, education like in like uh, and uh, came out of university with uh, with a lot of Marxist ideas, which we've ob obviously discussed how that has influenced his uh, his work and career. Uh, but like in in practical terms, just as a, as an in between animator at that the studio uh, that like declaring itself the uh, the Disney of the East. Uh, he was like just you know the uh, the uh, young talented uh, workhorse uh, who like helped organize uh, the the labor. Yeah, and we have to, but of course we've talked about the Marxism of both Takahata and uh, Miyazaki a lot, but we have to emphasize this is their 
early days of being really hardcore socialists in a way because uh, and this is stances they both both of them later distanced themselves from and you know have given more nuance and more thought to but this is their young rah rah days right so the reason that uh, Miyazaki got you know engaged with the uh, Toei Animators Union and rise, rose up the ranks of the union and why this union was even such an important thing is because at the time uh, where Miyazaki and Takahata were working at Toei Toya was kind of on a steep production schedule. They were pumping out movies every year with a the turnover of eight to ten months, like an almost like industrialized process of just animate, 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 cranking everything they could out of their young animators. And so that kind of required a strong union to stand on the side of labor and say, okay, those are not good practices. We want to do it a different way. And incidentally, Horus Prince of the Sun is a movie that was kind of born out of that uh, union rejection of the kind of toy production schedule because not only is the movie made by unionized people by all the people who explicitly identify with the union they got some funding from toy we're not really clear why toy corporate would just green light that but their idea was we want to make a movie in a different way we want to have like a team with more freedom with more time with like more creative say with more dem democratized structures no hierarchies in the production every one of the core production team gets to have their input and so on and so on especially takahara uh, fronted this project as director and uh otsuka uh who we will also mention a bit later uh the animation director, uh, they're both like really invested in the idea this should be an egalitarian production committee somehow. Yeah, and uh, and and in terms of like how Miyazaki fit in, into that, uh, as as mentioned before, he he was like a like a rising star, g gained some notoriety for for his like uh, skill and speed as a as as an in between animator, meaning the uh, uh, the uh, like factory floor workhorse uh type of uh uh job where where you uh, add like the animation cells in between the key animation uh, frames to uh to, to make the movement work and uh and and he had like uh he had sort of asserted himself in a, a previous production uh one uh, one called uh, Gulliver's uh, Travel to the Moon uh I believe it has a uh Jap Japanese title uh, somewhere. Gudiva no Uchi Ryoko uh, from 1965, um, where like he uh, so apparently uh, like made a, a a huge like creative contribution to like uh, a reveal at the uh, at the ending of the movie. A suggestion from this you know uh, a pretty low ranked uh, animator that uh, that made it into the final product. Which uh, sort of like uh, paved the way for him to having like a, a larger role in a, in this movie, um, which uh, which was as uh, as as you mentioned, not like very like collaborative, very much in that in that spirit, uh, and uh, and supposedly like a lot of like back and forth with uh, uh, Takahata and uh, and Miyazaki, with Takahata throwing out ideas and Miyazaki like sketching out uh, like a, a scene design, I, I believe is like what they they called his his task, like he was like building the world and like fleshing it out in uh, in drawing and uh, wasn't wasn't uh, it did a lot of work on like background Maybe. Uh, yeah i believe you worked on a huge amount of like the art design for the movie uh i was just going to add to that um according to susan napier like uh, interviews with miyazaki reveal that he really f felt he was like a lone wolf of an animator early in his career and like didn't get on with people and it was only until he worked on horus that he really learned to like artistically collaborate and i think that uh, it adds to what you're saying you know about the like industrialized process and it's like completely against the ghibli ethos of instead of um quick like direct production it's like sometimes overly long like several years of like uh just going around yeah. in circles to get this like very like artisan style because as we know, like Takahara and Mizaki have both gone on like very long productions for movies. Almost as their careers got on, they kept getting longer and longer. Because they always would fixate on the details and changing things as opposed to just making a thing for profit. Incidentally, while we're on the topic of career, we kind of mentioned uh, Miyazaki was working here as an in-between animator. He worked on Wolf Boy Ken. He worked on Gulawa's Travels. Um, Takahara as well uh, had already a few projects under his belt at this time. Um, he funny enough is a graduate of french literature in uh, you know he studied french literature and then he saw a french animated film by director paul grimaud 
the the king and the mockingbird from 1952 and decided you know that's what i'm going to do animation there's a quote of him saying if i had not seen this film i would never have imagined entering the world of animation i was obsessed not only because its expressions were superb but also because i realized that these unexpected ideas and images were not just fantasies or jokes but instead were concealing the difficult and harsh reality of modern history so he, he already had like a very strong investment in the idea of animation and he applied to Toei Doga and he was taken in as an assistant director and immediately put onto Wolf Boy Ken, where, you know, Miyazaki worked as an in-between animator. It is not clear if during that project they really had much of an encounter. We know that their relationship really started through the union work more or less and not on this project because it seems like Miyazaki played more or less a small fiddle in that project as an in-between animator, one of many we assume, and Takahata not as the main director but as an assistant director. But as as this career con congealed and went on uh, Takahata was actually chosen to be full director for his first feature film with Horace Prince of the Sun, which is a pretty big deal because it's really the point that we should point to for Isao Takahata to start becoming a world-renowned director, even though horrors didn't make that much of an international splash at, at yeah, first. Yeah, and quite, quite well, a few Well, there's an interesting story behind that as well, because um, Horace was actually kind of like uh, fucked over by the studio on purpose a bit. Because uh, I don't know if we mentioned it yet, but um, the Horace production was like way longer than it was supposed to be. It was about three years as opposed to, you said, like the eight to ten months expected by Toei. And it was this very unorthodox, uh, out there style production that was very egalitarian. And yeah. Toei had already had like a bunch of conflicts with the unions already. Yeah. So, way um, behind schedule, a, way over budget. Yeah, according to uh, uh, Patrick Dresden, he, he says... Horace was a brilliant look, but the bosses at Toei didn't know uh, its quality, and so they used it as a chance to stick it to the unions. Uh, the film was only shown in Japanese theaters for 10 days and saw, of course, very s small box office returns. So they essentially used the movie as a way to like prove that the unions and the uh, this kind of production uh, was a failure by intentionally kind of kneecapping the movie on release. Uh, and this is almost definitely why uh, Miyazaki... And Takahata would leave Toei within a few yeah. years after completing only a few other projects. Yeah, I, I, I think that, it was their last on project it, but... at Toei, actually. Um, I, according to this, they did, Miyazaki worked on one other thing, like a retelling of The Arabian Nights, but it was, again, like a smaller thing that, that, that they didn't do a whole lot more. They didn't do anything yeah. big that they directed. Nothing big. Yeah, I, I, I imagine like the... Uh, like as as as, as much as, as I'm uh, I'm on these guys' side, I, I I can imagine like a uh, reasonable studio like looking at this and being like, this was a, a mistake. This is like way over budget. Way like we we need we need to brush this thing out immediately. And yeah. uh, no, Takahata, you you cannot do this shit again. And uh, and them having to like go elsewhere for 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 further work. That that makes sense. But but it you're right. It is suspicious. The uh, the really extremely limited release window yeah. um just that 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 does seem like hmm yeah a bit suspicious yeah and you know we just really have to stress what 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 a utopian project that was for them because they went into this with big idealistic ideas about how this production should go for them the idea was by demonstrating that we as the unionists can produce a movie in a better working environment we will liberate animators, we will create collaborative environments, we will enable them to perform their best in a team. And they had like an unofficial slogan for the team, uh, for the production of Horrors, that was kind of like, let's do this together. So their idea really was to break down what they called arbitrary hierarchies within animation, which I think is pretty funny if put into perspective with how much we know about how the practices at Studio Ghibli later would be very authoritarian and top-down in the sense that Miyazaki would have sometimes really cruel oversight over basically everything and would not shy away from shitting on people, you know, who did something he didn't like. Uh, it's it's yeah. pretty fun or interesting, maybe a bit disheartening or heartening, depending on how you want to see it, uh, that from this idealistic experiment of equity, equality, egalitarianism in anime production, they went back to saying, well, actually, if you want to get shit done, you know, you, you gotta you gotta have some order and structure, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's sad in a way, but like, it 
it, it it is still, like the movie business is uh, the animation business is still a business like the like just maybe maybe someday in like the future you know utopian space communism uh where, where, where everything is free and everyone is like free to do what they want that that would be like more a more viable option but yeah um like hats hats off to them for for, for the ambition and and, and it, it paid off in some ways as, as we'll see in the movie so yeah, uh, I think yeah, Miyazaki's probably become a bit more jaded in the years. You're right, like he he's um a very overbearing like auteur of a director, but I do think fundamentally the, the principles behind Horus that I think Miyazaki definitely kept with his career was to make a movie that is like an artistic vision as opposed to just what was ever handed to them. Because actually, there's another quote from Miyazaki in 1995 when talking about his career at Toei that I found where he says, um, they they told us uh, you can't do a, like a like an interesting classical story because it won't sell tickets. You have to put like a, a furry, fuzzy animal creature in it or something. So Miyazaki really wanted to prove with Horus, and as we saw with a bunch of his later works, you could tell these more like compelling stories that uh, weren't necessarily directly at children while still being like good animation. Yeah, uh, and in fact, they did not just put in a talking animal, they put in three. They did, yeah, but, but they used quite good talking to animals. Fair, yeah. Like, like uh, I have a lot of say about the talking animals later on, but yeah. Okay, yeah, when, when we get to discussing the actual plot themes and so on. But yeah, production starts in 1965, and, you know, because of whatever perfectionism or maybe the kinks and flaws of having such a democratic process, they took three years to complete this movie at this time for toy absolutely unimaginable and unprecedented but you know let's just talk a little bit about kind of the team they had like a maybe a few notable names in that team and how they kind of work together to kind of try and understand because we often we understand Miyazaki and Takahata to be kind of like auteurs in their own way but in this movie it would be a lot fairer to say that while their ideas are all over the place definitely the kind of production they had is definitely less you know, auteur-like. It is more of a collaborative effort. So whenever we say uh, Takahata did this in this movie, we should really add an asterisk and say all of these people that we're now going to mention do this. Because the core team, basically, there were more animators involved and more other people involved, but the core team was Takahata as director, Yasuo Otsuka as animation director, Miyazaki as key animation and what they call scene design, which is not really clear what that role means. Uh, Yasuji Mori as key animator, Reiko Okuyama as key animation, and Yoichi Kotabe as key animation. So, so these are the people that I've read uh, have been basically the core committee that were discussing all of the storyboard ideas. And this team contributed, all of them contributed to character designs, to story ideas, to storyboards, and so on. So there's no one storyboarder, there's no one character designer, there's no one story writer. They all equitably participated. Except Takahata is not an animator, so he doesn't didn't contribute to character designs. He can't draw for shit. He knows that, so he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I think one, it shows actually yeah. because um the movie is stylistically like quite odd and over the all over the place in yeah. some areas. Like the entire last like twenty minutes of the movie have these like weird psychedelic sequences where Horus is in this like maze of this light and shit, and then the ending sequence is this kind of strange thing where you don't exactly even understand the fucking layout of the building that they're in because it keeps shifting every shot. And like, that's nothing like anything Miyazaki or Takahata would do in the rest of their career. So you can really see that like there was definitely a lot of different artistic voices all over this. Yeah, and then there's, there's so to, to some degree, like you, uh, you can't really uh, point the finger directly at, at like, what was, was this like, a result of the production being like rushed into theaters at the very end, uh, and 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 what parts were like uh, a, a result of this, like uh, d- like this democratic uh, like w- uh, mode of uh, of storyboarding, which uh, led to some like uh, unevenness uh, as as they like it, it was like a very new way of of doing things. Uh, though I, I will say there are a, co- a couple of sequences, namely like when the uh, the, when the town is like attacked by wolves and later by rats, that where the movie just turns into a slideshow for yes, a literally. quick while. That yeah, there were too many of, like, enemies student, on screen. So the, like, it's like vampire survivors. There are too many enemies on screen, so the frame rate just plummets. Yeah, like, the, the Unreal Engine zero point one that this movie was running on could not handle 
that much, and the the frame rate just tanks. Yeah, no, but 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 the the this this. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fun comparison, but like they are clearly like capable of uh, animating crowd scenes pretty well. Like there's a, there's a s- sequence early on where the the fish return to the river and and the whole like village like celebrates and uh, and uh, harvests and uh, and it's very like like well animated with a lot of cuts with a lot of moving pieces and you, you like you imagine how how that could be like su- successfully translated into an action scene with a lot of moving parts and stuff and uh, but yeah uh, th- that that definitely like stinks like f- from like from a long distance away for uh stinks of uh rushed production and like uh didn't didn't get to quite finish it well Definitely. it's interesting because i feel those sequences they're like fully realized is, is is what's weird like there's basically you can see the difference between each animation cut as they're going so they yeah. weren't even like rushed they clearly had the entire sequence storyboarded and mostly like understood they just did not have the time i guess probably to uh to in between it and actually make it move because that would have been a quite a long undertaking with like literally hundreds of characters moving on screen at a time. Uh, but I will say, just as one side note, from a historical context, like we're looking at back at it now, it's it's a bit odd and noticeable. But I will say, if you watch any animation from the '60s, there is definitely a lot of stuff like this where like complex sequences are reduced to like storyboards or like single images where there's would be too much movement and like reused animation and stuff that was like all over 60s television so it wouldn't have been like a big noticeable thing to audiences at the time i don't think well like it, it would mm, i i i would argue that that it is like uh, and probably was at the time noticeable mostly because the uh like the sequences that are like uh, that have a lot of effort put into them are uh, like so like markedly like I- impressive compared to, to yeah. like some of the stuff that surrounds it that like it, it it's it's just uh, I, I guess you could call it like a, a like a progenitor of like uh, sakuga as as we understand it in, in Japanese animation today where like the uh, a lot of like uh, effort goes into like uh, key like set piece sequences uh, and uh, the a- animation frames are like uh, Saved on in uh, in other parts of, uh, of of the film, though uh, I, I I will I will say the Japanese uh, animation industry got a lot like better at like uh, at uh, managing that than, yeah. uh, than this movie uh, is. You you might be right because I I definitely think that it would probably make a contrast in watching the movie. You're right because like the opening scenery is fighting the wolves, for example, is like insanely well done. So I guess maybe the audience would have like felt the disparity within the film. I'm just saying, you know, like in a general sense, the the '60s was a very weird time for animation, yeah. where like what flew and what didn't was like in constant flux because people still didn't really have a good idea of it as a medium. Yeah, yeah, but I I, I do still imagine that it's uh it's it's not uh. I, uh, obviously, like we can't like read their minds, and then we don't have like an official source. But I, I have a hard time imagining that uh, that that way of presenting those sequences was like uh, the artistic vision. Uh, I, I am much more ready to believe that the studio jumped in and, and were like, "We need to get this like back on schedule." And you and one of the techniques they would use for that, uh, be, because as we mentioned earlier, they had like had like much shorter uh, production schedules usually was like taking these sequences and be like, okay, which ones can we turn into slideshows with, with sound? I mean, and, matter uh, of fact is that. that, you know, the, the, the studio, Toy Dolga, basically imposed on them that they cut the movie short. Like, there's like about half an hour that they had to cut from what was originally intended to be there. And, you know, that and what you say, like the slideshows that were definitely, you know, uh, a consequence of them not having enough time to finish these extremely complex scenes. Like, it was very ambitious even that they tried to do these scenes. What we see in those still frames are basically not even keyframes, right? Keyframes would be more frames than that. Yeah, there'd, there'd be more animation than if they were just keyframes. They're essentially comic each book. individual bit of the um, yeah, it's, it's more storyboards. Storyboard frames. They, just, yeah, yeah. they just took the storyboards and completely yeah. colorized those. Yeah, exactly. They're well painted, right? It's not like they are lackluster. They're well painted as well as the rest of the movie. But they are just, you know, still frames one a second, basically. And they have like funny sound effects and show like like a dude like hitting a wolf on the head or something, but it's like all still. So definitely a cost cutting measure. But 
despite all of these issues, and we as, you know, experienced uh, animation veterans, we ha can see many issues. We can see characters go off model and we can see some awkward and stilted animation that wouldn't happen again in this, this way yeah, in other missing lip Ghibli productions. And, yeah. Lip flaps, all of that stuff. Yeah, But still, at the time, it was very, very impressive because we need to understand that the kind of sakuga, so like the high quality moments, the set pieces, were outstanding for the time and not just for the time, even today. Like there's a big fight against a giant fish and that is uh, an outstanding milestone of like animation history. It's definitely well worth watching just from the standpoint of seeing impressive, you know, action animation as an extensive long set piece that wasn't really done at the time. And it was treated by critics as a film to rival Disney. There was the impression that finally here in this far off land in Japan, of all places, there's an animation industry that has the capacity to create motion, you know, at least at times, at moments, on par with Disney's productions, who had basically a global hegemony on animation at the time in terms of quality animation. You know, whatever Soviet animation and Japanese animation you had at the time didn't really measure up, but horrors critics saw as one of the ones that could uh, maybe accede to that level and challenge that, which, you know, is a claim we will find echoed throughout the entire history of Studio Ghibli, which is basically later being treated as the Disney of Japan in some ways, even though that comparison is very awkward and unfitting in many ways. Yeah, and uh, to add some uh, some context to that, uh, at Disney in the 1960s, uh, they, they, they'd slowed down their production a lot, especially in the 50s. I think they only like released like, two movies in, in the 50s. Uh, and, uh, and and a few in the in the sixties, and the, uh, the the one that came out around the uh, the, the time of uh, Horus was uh, the Jungle Book, uh, which actually was the the last movie uh, that Walt Disney would be a producer on. He uh, he died uh, before its uh, its release, uh, and it, and and that sort of um, uh, presaged like a a, a sort of a, a, a slowdown, a lowering in like the high prestige quality stuff. Uh, movies like uh, the uh, the Aristocat cats like were um, what came out of uh, of Disney in the in the seventies. So so that so that there is like that element to it as well, where where we you had this uh, monumental uh, animation studio like that was like synonymous with uh, animated features, which was sort of on the decline. And then uh, you just imagine like a Western critic like uh, getting to see this movie. And just some of the sequences uh, in it just uh, absolutely like uh, rivaling or even like uh, blowing out of the water the, the stuff coming out of uh, of the House of Mouse. Uh, yeah, as, as, as you mentioned, the, uh, the, the pike uh, scene, the giant uh, demonic fish that, uh, that uh, uh, Horus fights is just wildly impressive uh, in its like fluidity, its, its action, its tension. Um, and there are, there, are, there are a few other standout sequences uh, as well uh, that, that are yeah. like well worth the price of admission. And as a general um, yeah. feature, you know, parallax scrolling, which is a technique used in animation where you have different cell layers moved at different speeds to create the illusion of depth. Like the background will move more slowly because, you know, if you look into the distance, you see mountains and you walk, you know, in some direction, the mountains will very slowly move, you know. Parallax scrolling emulates that in animation. And that is a technique used all over the place in this movie. And it's not the first movie uh, in Japanese animation that did it. But before that, especially Toy Doga movies were really, really flat. They were basically like moving characters on one flat plane. Parallax scrolling brings a 2.5D, a depth element into a scene. And it was a really important animation technique used all over the place in this movie, leading to impressive, you know, scenery shots and like white establishing shots and like tons of movement through these different cell layers being shifted in relation towards each other. And it's really uh, important to notice how much of an influential feat that was because Parallax would become basically the default animation style of all anime for like years to come until like CG started revolutionizing how camera movement would happen. As we discussed, yeah. for example, in the Pompoko episode, uh, if you remember that, where we talked about the first CG background that uh, Ghibli started using. Yeah, and I, I want to uh, highlight there's a very specific shot uh, in the movie where uh, it, I believe it's like the first time that, that Hilda is, is sitting and singing in front of the whole village. 
and and there's a, there's a shot where like we where we pan like uh, by the the crowd uh, looking up towards her, and just the way the parallax uh, effect like works with uh, with these like animated and non animated villages just gi- gives the, the, this brief uh, moment where I I could swear I was watching something like uh, truly three D like th- this movie will just have these shots these images these uh, bits of animation that are just like uh, ab- absolutely like virtuosic uh, and then like uh, in another scene that it will be like uh, a, a, a lot flatter some missing lip flaps and uh, uh, and, and then like uh, turn into a slideshow a couple of times it, it, it is very uneven in that way but uh, yeah yeah um I, I just uh, there's no great transition here, but I'll just uh, I, I just want to mention some of the staffers and what other things they worked on. Um, you know, the staffers that we can kind of credit these animation innovations, these incredible shots, and you know, some of the not so incredible shots too. Um, first of all, we have uh, someone who we will talk about a little bit later as well, which is Kazuo Fukazawa, who wrote the screenplay or rather the original story that was adapted by the core team we just mentioned. We will talk about this a little bit mo- uh, later. But this guy is not really from animation, but he's known only for one other really important contribution to animation history, which is that he is the scriptwriter on one of the more famous world masterpiece theater shows, which is 3000 Leagues in Search of Mother. Uh, not much else beyond that. Then, of course, animation director Otsuka Yasuo, who had a huge part in influencing the early careers of Miyazaki and Takahata and was one of the main heads behind this, you know, approach to collaborative animation work. He is known for lots of key animations and animation direction on legendary anime. That includes Hakujaden, so the movie, uh, Panda and the Magic Serpents would be the tra- translation. That's the movie that Miyazaki, you know, fell in love with, where he uh, fell in love with the animated character, something we called him an otaku for in previous episodes. But Yasuo was also involved in Astro Boy, Moomin, later Lupin the Third. Uh, and Panda Kopanda, Future by Conan, so collaborations with Miyazaki and Takahata later on as well, and many more. So basically one of the OGs of original anime greatness. Then we have a composer, Mamiya Michio, who I mention especially, first of all, because the soundtrack to Horus is really, really good, like strong usage of children's choirs, very catchy melodies and high energy, but also a lot of melancholy and songs of Hilda that we will probably be analyzing a bit later. Um, But this composer also worked with Takahata on Gosh the Shellist and Grave of the Fireflies. So here we have our first staffer who we can directly tie into another Ghibli production that we've already discussed. And while we're on that, Michio Yasuda. She is uh, the, the person who was responsible for coloring in every single, basically every single Ghibli movie ever made uh, uh, until the day she died. I think she died somewhere uh, sometime in the 2010s. Um, Until then, and starting here, she has been on team, on staff with Miyazaki and Takahata coloring their movies. So legendary staffer. And uh, she, uh, in an interview, uh, you know, as one of the more important Ghibli people who stuck with them for 30, 40 years, um, she remembers that the Horus team burned with idealism, is a quote from her, and that the real theme of the movie is one of the, uh, of the ideal of the labor union. That is her words, so, you know, uh, keep that in mind. Aside from Yasuda and the other people mentioned just now, uh, there were a few key animators who would continue to collaborate with Miyazaki and Takahata on shows such as Heidi and uh, Anne of Green Gables, Hijabai Konin, or Yaren Kochie. But none of them would become steady Ghibli staffers after the studio's founding. So lots of interesting people on this project, some of the animation history of the past, but notably not many people who would become Ghibli staffers later. That is really limited to uh, Takahata, Miyazaki, and um, um, Yasuda. And uh, so, uh, Nyad, you mentioned that the... uh, um that the, the the story w- was very like uh, collaboratively like written and uh, and 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 laid out uh, but but it did have a, a an original source um it was uh adapted from a uh, a puppet play which was based on an uh, Ainu folk tale uh, Ainu being a, a native people in a, in a, a the northern regions of, in uh, of Japan yeah. which we also talked about in the in Princess Mononoke um, 
Well, and, we talked uh, about a different minority in Princess Mononoke. <laughs> was it different? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. There's more. Japan. Misinformation. It's, it's, very, it's not very well known, honestly, because Japan has kind of tried to redu- remove its own multi-ethnicity. But Japan is a multi-ethnic country. Like, they have tons of different ethnicities in Japan. Like, the Ainu are just one of them. Uh, I think the, the, the ones in Princess Mononoke were the uh, Emishi. I, I might be misremembering the name. Yeah, I believe they were the Emishi people. Um, yeah. And they, they they make reference to a couple of other indigenous groups that have pretty much all been <laughs> fucking wiped out since then uh, in like the the uh, the early first millennium. Um, but okay, yeah, I, the Ainu uh, people no, are from stupid. Hokkaido. They're like the natives of uh, Hokkaido, typically. Yeah. A region yeah, known for being Northern very Island. very fucking cold, which makes sense in this if you look at this movie. <laughs> Yeah, uh, except this uh, this this movie um, is like the setting is moved uh, uh, away from uh, from Hokkaido to like uh, vaguely Scandinavia in like the Iron Age maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I've seen and, some uh, places yeah. mention Norway, but I'm not sure how they're getting Norway. Like I yeah, I have not there's, seen there's anything no, in the movie. Not specific. <laughs> I, I I will say it's definitely not Denmark. The, 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 it's Denmark's the, the sec, like the second flattest country on earth. Yeah, this uh, is not flat. This movie yeah. is very parallax scrolling, so yeah. not flat but at yeah, all. But yeah, it it has that like uh uh like northern uh like like uh, fjord landscape uh lots of rivers lots of like a, a fishing village uh more than more than like a farming town uh definitely not like a, a you know temperate uh, river valley or anything mm-hmm. um so yeah so, uh, yeah why did they change it from ainu to norway good question uh well we 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 don't really know but like the best guess is like the studio were like mm, sounds like politics let's uh let's move it to a foreign country instead. Thank yeah. you very much. In this context of the 60s, it should be mentioned that the Ainu, among other you know, groups, were also protesting, rioting, having a cultural reawakening at the time. So it's definitely a very on their minds, very cutting-edge political issue. So Toy Doga, at least... On Wikipedia, they say, like, to avoid controversy, they moved the setting. However, the source that they linked there is dead, and I couldn't track it down. So... Your best. Yeah, we don't exactly know who moved the. the we could, we would assume Toei did it, though. I do wonder, just like on pure speculation, I wonder if um, anyone on the actual team making the movie like wanted to do it because you know they weren't exactly uh, any I knew people themselves, so they probably just didn't know like how to actually tell the story without, um, you know, kind of just doing a. I guess you could say like an appropriation of it. Though again, that's that's maybe wishful thinking on my part. I mean, I mean, yeah, I think, it's, it's I very think much it is more definitely likely the, the studio case just stop them because it, it would be controversial. It is definitely the case that to even be interested in I knew uh, I knew oral traditions and folk tales, you would already have to be somewhere on the progressive and left leaning spectrum, right? Like that's why also the I knew the indigenous people. Uh, kind of joined the more left-wing protests at the time because that's kind of where their allegiances were. Like the only people who... Basically, Japan was on a long program of erasing its own multi-ethnic history and there was like a wrong program of Japanization of the Ainu people and erasure of the Ainu cultural identity during the Meiji Restoration period and the Japanese Empire, right? So the 60s were still in the middle of processing kind of what past history has affected these peoples and so on. So... A reawakening interest in their stories and their tr- oral traditions and so on would definitely come from a milieu that wouldn't be, you know, suspected of, uh, you know, being disrespectful towards the Ainu. At least that's my interpretation of the arrangement here. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, that's can... certainly possible because I could imagine Mizaki and Takahata fighting to have the story because it's an Ainu, uh, you know, oral story. Uh, and as we know, like with Mononoke, a story specifically about one of these indigenous ethnic groups. Uh, being essentially, you know, fading from history and being uh, susumed under the will of like the larger uh, Japanese hegemony. Yeah, yeah basically, that, that was it, a big thesis in Monoko. Like, the idea of Japanese history is not just the history of samurai and peasants, but we have so many other groups, and, you know, those are not talked about. And I guess this is a very early example of them tackling one of those other groups, but, you know, by supplanting the setting... Uh, it's really questionable what remains of that original spark. I mean, it is based on the oral tradition, and uh, I guess we're going to talk about it in the analysis part a bit more, but it really feels like a folktale. Like, this entire story is like, 
weird fairy tale logic, bizarre, like, you know, lots of elements we'll probably talk about, but the, it feels like a folktale. So I don't know how close it is to that original. It's not like we could easily track down a transcendent copy, but, you know, I, I'm willing to believe that there's a, some genuine investment in, you know, spreading Ainu storytelling into the world somehow. Yeah, and, and you can imagine the uh, so the, the the credited writer um, Kazuo uh, Fukasawa who wrote the um, uh, the puppet play which uh, got turned into this uh, this movie uh, was kind of like part of that like uh, counterculture movement and found this like a folk tale and wanted to like retell it in uh, you know uh, you 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 could sort of imagine it uh, coming out of that like it's some you know university um like uh, uh liberal arts like uh, idea of like reviving this uh, uh yeah. some of these stories in various ways so to be clear we um, need to imagine because we don't know that's just speculation yeah. <laughs> well the uh the story itself maybe yes uh now is the time to, to get please into fill that. us in yeah so uh the, uh, the 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 story uh, cold opens as mentioned earlier on uh, the, uh, this kid uh, Horus uh, fighting a bunch of like extremely angry and determined wolves um, with a with a uh, a steel axe at the end of a rope um, and, uh, and and getting sort of bailed out by a uh, a giant stone monster uh, named uh, was it Maug or Muag I think it was Maug Maug yeah Maug uh big big rumbling like really cool animation uh on uh, on that guy uh and, uh and 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 he's like oh i was sleeping uh but oh also i have the splinter in me and also the splinter turns out to be a sword that no one can pull out except horus pulls it out and it turns out the sword is in fact a it's a pretty rusted sword but if he reforges it he is told he will uh, uh he will become the uh, uh prince of the sun and you know some good prophecy stuff will happen um and with that prologue finished uh we get to uh prologue part two the other prologue of the story uh where uh horace's uh father is uh, is dying uh he seems very old uh so hopefully in natural causes um and uh, and uh, and on his uh, on his deathbed he uh, he tells horace that uh that he like they, they both of them were once part of this uh, this tribe who got um uh, who got destroyed by like a demon that divided them against themselves, and uh, and and the village got destroyed, and he fled with Horus. But now here on his deathbed, he realizes that you know Horus, you can't you can't go on alone. That that's not how humans are. Uh, so go and find them. Uh, and he gave them like general directions, but like not like any like particular coordinates. So um, so with that, problem number two finished. The movie begins again. Uh, with Horus and his uh, talking bear uh, cub friend, uh, just uh, heading heading out, sailing out, uh, and uh, reaching a, another shore, uh, he he meets for a brief second the uh, the uh, uh, the named uh, the named devil. Um, what, what was his name again? The Grunwald. Grunwald. Gundam. Grunwald. Crimes of Grindelwald, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> Grindelwald. Grunwald. Yeah. Uh, Gondwald. Gondwald. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, All right, yeah. It does the classic. Gondwald. It does the classic temptation scene. Yeah, yeah. He's and like, really, oh, really this I like movie, your vibes. Become my brother. And he's yeah, like, it, it hits you. a lot of the uh, hero's journey things. I mean, I, I know a lot of criticism has been made of uh, jo uh, Joseph Campbell, right? Uh, yeah, yeah his, that's Joseph Campbell. And his, and his book. Uh, and there's like a lot of obvious literary criticism that can be made of him, and anthropologically. But I do think it's interesting how. Just how many notes along the story this hits specifically, but we got it more towards the beginning. Uh, yeah. Sorry, continue playing as you were saying. Were you? Yeah, Ho uh, Horus falls off a, off a cliff. Uh, 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 Gunvald uh, presumes him dead, uh, but he does uh, wash up uh, at, uh, in fact, the exact village he was looking for. Uh, Who would have thunk? Um, where he is, uh, he's uh, pretty like he's he's taken care uh, care of. Uh, he, uh, he he meets an old uh, like uh, smith who uh, who's like, yeah, we uh, th this sword might be like reforgeable, but like uh, sounds challenging. Uh, and the village is facing some trouble. Uh, specifically, they uh, that there aren't any more fish because a giant, uh, very evil uh, pike is uh, uh, like taking it all for for itself. Uh, and, and and just then, like a, a valued member of the community has uh, has died trying to fight it, and there's a there's there's a brief uh, bit of drama about like uh, 
the men of the village wanting to go out to kill it, and uh, and the widow of of of, of the, the killed warrior is just like, no, no, stop, stop, don't go to your death, deaths for nothing. And so Horus decides, uh, you know what, I'll go to uh, my death, but in, but since I'm the protagonist, I'm going to defeat this thing, which it does. Uh, uh, not easy, and uh, one of the like coolest bits of animation in, in the story. Uh, he returns, the fish return, and he is like the hero of the village. Uh, although we are also uh, in- in- introduced to, to this like really like real big asshole like uh, poison into the chieftain's ear uh, guy uh, Drago, who's just like uh, I-, I don't trust the guy. He seems too uh, too spunky. Uh, I don't like that. Uh, me and my the big. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's lines that, under my eyes, yeah. He's that, that dude from fucking Lord of the Rings, Grima, Wormtongue. Yeah, uh, yeah Wormtongue. Worm yeah. yeah. Well, I actually had that written down. He's sort of like a, I think he's a, he's kind of the opposite of Wormtongue in an interesting way, just as a small analysis on him. Because Wormtongue, as we know, is actually working for Saruman. He was all like a, he's like a scheme. But this guy, I'm pretty sure, like, he's just doing it for himself. Like, he's not actually working for the bad guy, like you would assume. He's more of just like, I feel like the movie's more representing him as like the naysayer even within a group. Because if we take like kind of the socialist metaphor of the village, the community, there's still even within that, you know, lovey-dovey in-group, there's still going to be kind of an asshole who has all these counter opinions and is going to kind of doubt the the wisdom of the group. Yeah, so he's that asshole. Yeah, yeah, I feel like like, um, they're sort of, they're addressing the problems with a group thinking structure because people can be easily misled in a group as well because we see as well later in the movie Horus is kind of framed and the most of the village turns against him so I, I think the movie is in a little bit of a maturity is highlighting the way that uh this kind of uh, collective consciousness uh can you know turn bad as well yeah so uh so like uh after uh Horus is like uh fully inducted into the village uh the uh uh, the, the evil Gunvald uh, like uh, realizes he's alive and sends uh, his wolves to attack the village, um, where where we have that slideshow as mentioned earlier. Um, slideshow number one with the wolves. slideshow number one, yeah. <laughs> the uh, the wolves attack the village, uh, and they uh, uh, Horus chases after the the wolves, but uh, but loses like the the lead silver wolf. It, it disappears, but he does what he does find is another village, a an abandoned uh, coastal village, uh, and there uh, he finds uh, Hilda, a a girl about his age, uh, it seems, who uh, who is uh, has a very beautiful singing voice, uh, has uh, has two uh, animal friends just flexing on him with only one talking animal friend. Uh, she has he has an owl which is like pretty shady and a squirrel which is uh, too nice for this. Um, and, uh, and, and she's, uh, she's very sad because her whole village got, uh, got destroyed, uh, by, by the devil, by Grunwald, it is, it is supplied and, uh, uh, and she's like very alone, but pretends not to survival. be lonely. And, uh, and Horus is like, uh, come on, come to the village. They will welcome you, uh, when they hear you sing. And, uh, and she does, uh, come with them to the village and she does sing and they do welcome her. Um, even, even Drago is like, ah, good singing. I, I like that. Uh, which is a bad sign by the way, because Drago is an asshole. Um, as it, uh, as, as it turns out, there's some, uh, some darker stuff going on, uh, under the surface with Hilda. Uh, as, as we learn later on, she is, uh, the quote unquote sister of, uh, of Gunvald, though it seems she's like more like, it's more like an adopted situation, uh, like that he declared you are now my sister. Uh, I mean, remember, is, uh, he asked Horus yeah. to be his brother. It feels like he's picking yeah, up these that soul survivors exactly. that have some kind of special skill and then saying, hey, you you help me be like misanthropic and destroy the world or something. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and, and Hilda, uh, unlike Horus, uh, di- did not say no and fall off a cliff. Instead, she received the uh, the gift and curse of immortality. Uh, and, and in exchange, she is like, uh, has to be his loyal servant. So she's obviously like angsty and conflicted about it, especially because like uh, cute villagers keep being cute to her. Uh, and uh, and she gets like angry and, and resentful when they start like talking about, you know, uh, the, this this marriage that's that's going to be going on. Uh, and, and then they try to like uh, include her in, in, in that and be like, oh, you, you're going to need to sew and one day you'll be a beautiful bride. And uh, and and she uh, she's not having any of that, and so she uh, she unleashes her like uh, super powered angst spell, which uh, unleashes uh, rats upon the village for slide sl- slideshow number two, um, where the uh, th- th- this time with a like a, a transparent overlay of rats running, um, the uh, uh, everyone's pretty much fine. 
uh, Horace, Horace didn't like see what happened. Uh, he was out uh, chasing after the, uh, the 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 wolf. Um, but when he returns, uh, she uh, she sows the idea that uh, in fact Horace is responsible because uh, no one's ever seen this silver wolf and, and and no one saw him defeat the the pike and and he's suspicious and he's an outsider and everyone should mistrust him. Uh, and she collaborates with uh, with Drago also to uh, to turn the village uh, against him. Um, eventually, like uh, s- stealing his uh, his axe, uh, framing him for an for an attempted attack on the uh, the, the village chief, uh, and just uh, like uh, running him out, running him out of town. Um, uh, can I actually say uh, I thought it was really funny that no one believes uh, the frame job at the beginning because typically the way this goes in the movie. It's like the town immediately turns on him. But I like the like several times people are like, nah, anyone could have thrown that axe. You're full of shit. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it was he, fun. He, like uh, Hilda or rather like uh, her like evil owl. Her evil familiar, owl buddy like, had to like do some an illusion, illusion trick, magic yeah. to, uh, to make Horace, uh, Horace like throw an axe towards her. And, uh, and that, uh, that, that, that that like does it. Uh, he, uh, yeah, he, con- he confronts uh, Hilda o- o- outside the village and, and, and is like, uh, what's happening? Why are you doing this? Stop doing this. This is not you. And she's like, actually, this is ex- exactly me. Uh, pulls out a dagger and... Uh, stabs question mark him uh, unclear uh, but he does fall down into the uh, what is it the forest of doubt or like um, the shadow realm yeah he is banished to the shadow yeah, realm yeah it was a four, he was four kids quote unquote stabbed and then banished to the shadow realm <laughs> yeah well uh, th- th- this is where we have like this like really like um, like abstract space where he is like trapped in and 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 uh, and Gunval is like really happy, like ah ha ha. He will he will he will wander end- endlessly. He will die in there uh, for sure this time, for real, hundred uh, percent. No no villain has ever uh, left the hero to to die uh, out of sight, uh, and and it has not gotten right for them. Um, at any rate, uh, Hilda uh, is is even more angsty, uh, and and is once once again told like uh, nah nah. If you if you try to turn against me, the village will turn against you. You will die, and you don't want to die. That's why you became immortal, right? Um, it's a, uh, it's cool. Now, now time to destroy the village. And he, he does arrive at, at the village, uh, unleashing like a, a, an eternal winter, winter type of, um, type of spell upon them all, uh, uh summons a, a giant ice mammoth with the, which is just absolutely metal. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the village, they, uh, they, they do come together to, uh, to, to light some, some enormous bonfires to keep the, keep the cold away, keep, uh, keep the enemy away. Um, uh, Hilda, she uh, uh, she saves uh, Horace's like um, a bear cub friend and uh, uh, and and also the, the a sweet kid from the village who are like out in the cold. Uh, she sacrifices her immortality. Uh, in the meantime, Horace, uh, having d- finished his like belly of the whale vision quest hero's journey thing, uh, realizes that the, the power of friendship is what he needs. The power of community, and he returns to the village and they reforge the sword in like the big fires, the big bonfires. And just as promised, uh, in a socialist uh, montage, Maug, yeah, and, and just as promised, the uh, the uh, Earth Giant uh, Maug uh, arrives to, to to see him with a with the sword, and uh, and and uh, just absolutely k- kicks ass in a in a kaiju fight, uh, and and with the sword he can he can fight against Gunvald. Gunvald returns to his uh, uh, to his domain to, to his ice castle, uh, and all the villagers like uh, arrive there really quickly. This is all like happening in like fifteen minutes, like the the. the uh, large climax of, of, of the story, uh, and 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 with the sun like uh, sunlight just beaming down on him and reflected in the in there like uh, the, the the sun sword, uh, he is defeated and the ice castle disappears and uh, and even it turns out uh, Hilda she's uh, she, she she wakes up at, 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 as as spring uh, as the thawing spring arrives she wakes up and uh, returns to the village and uh, and everything is uh, happily ever after the end. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you for the thumar- summary, Platon. Um, maybe it became evident uh, during your summary. Summary. All your summary was so good and compelling that it kind of hides the narrative structure flaws. I think that happen here there. But wow, this is, this film has a really weird narrative structure. It kind of, you know, it kind of feels like we're drifting from random events. Like you know, he finds the sword and he's like, "Yay, happy!" Goes home. Your dad is dying. 
unhappy. And then he, you know, washes ashore in a foreign land, finds people, and is like, yay, happy. And then, oh no, the but the fish is evil, unhappy, you know. And then, yay, you killed the fish, we will celebrate you. And then, no, the wolves are attacking, unhappy. And as he is chasing the wolf, he meets a girl, yay, happy. <laughs> you know, and it keeps but going like that. But the girl like is that. angsty and immortal, not happy. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> There's a lot of what one might call and then st storytelling where like uh, sometimes things happen and then this happens and then this happens like the, the, this uh, with uh, the relationship between them being sort of sort of abstract, but like pseudo explained with like, oh, that's that's Grunwald. He, 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 he controls the wolves. So he sends them after he learns he's alive because the fish died or something. But yeah, it, it's not like not a lot of like clear progression. It's mostly like uh, horrors like trying to just like vibe with the village and like be be part of that and uh, and everything is fine and uh, and Gunval uh through uh, what 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 one might call the uh, the uh, what is known as uh, the, the Gargamel ga uh, gambit uh, sending uh, sending Hilda in to uh, to cause uh, d disruption yeah the story certainly has that um we're talking about it's obviously from an oral tradition and has that very fairy tale folklore um you could almost call it like free association yeah. fantasy yeah, yeah. where like th things aren't explained. It doesn't really matter. You know, things just are as they are and they happen as they happen. Like a, like a funny moment right towards the end of the film is someone just tosses an amulet to Horace and says, here, this will make you fly. And he goes, okay, I guess. And then he jumps on the back of a ghost wolf and starts flying because apparently yeah. he, can, he just knows how to do that <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah. and, and I definitely yeah, think that's the case. Like it feels very much like a myth is being you know made manifest here and uh, uh you know you have this grand like the the sword and the stone uh, like in the arthurian legends and then you have like a giant golem guy and he's like yes you will reforge this sword one day and slay the grunwald who's grunwald yeah, there's this nasty dude you know there's just this one nasty dude it's like He's a devil. Oh. He re represents uh, the Discord trying to pull uh, close knit communities yeah. apart. So, so keep up. <laughs> at the end of the day, I think we can maybe agree that a lot of this movie is just like symbolic in the way that fairy tale and folk tale are. Like, there's like big threads that symbolize something. You know, the 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 wizard uses ice and cold. You know, in a way that resembles kind of the harsh winters in Norway slash Hokkaido, you know, like how the people would have to survive like the threat of death and winter and starvation. Same with the fish, you know, uh, with, with cultures dependent on like fishing and subsistence, you know, living f off of the nature. Then something like, I don't know, in this season, the fish didn't come as much and we were, we were all starving. That's like the biggest catastrophe. So it feels like all of these events and like basically every idea of the storytelling is like, symbolic in some way reflective of like discussing humanity's nature uh, relationship to nature and community versus isolation i think that's where i am landing because the story itself is really really chaotic and the wizard yeah. you know is not really doing anything like he doesn't have a comprehensible motive he's like i just kind of hate humans and i want to destroy their villages and so like discontent that's it like literally grunwald has yeah, he's nothing a, he's beyond a force that. of nature uh, being of pure evil type of yeah. villain. Um, and, and yeah. Not even, not even, yeah, not even just that. I think just leaving it as force of nature would be good enough because I think Grunwald is meant to represent human nature in a way. Like humans will cause division. They will fight. They will have power struggles. They will doubt and, you know, question each other. And there will be challenges to community that, you know, are what this village, uh, what this wizard represents, right? Like that is the force of nature here. The wizard just represents a really bad tendency that humans have that they destroy their own communities and fall apart and don't exhibit full solidarity. That's actually. Um, I, I I disagree. I think there's a little bit more to Gunvald uh, in the story, particularly towards the end, where it's explained that Gunvald wants to be immortal, or he already is immortal. But also somehow to be immortal, you have to like kill the rest of humanity or something like that. Again, not, not much is explained in the movie, but it's kind of like the thing he tells Hilda and like Hilda is like, you can rather live forever or you can like live as a human in the, the fishing village. And uh, it's kind of like not just this human nature, but it's almost like this perverse subversion of nature and this kind of running away from life that we see yeah. in plenty of yes. other of like Miyazaki's work. As a, as a similar theme that clearly inspired him of like in order to like you know 
if, if you reject death, you essentially also reject life. You reject what it is to live. And so um, Gunvold, in his kind of like greediness, just wants to like hold on to life and be cold and isolated because yes. he's not quite the force of nature because he also is like a clear subversion of it. Like, for example, the big fish that takes up all the fish in the stream, like the way it should be is you have some big fish, but also, you know, the stream maintains life by having fish constantly go through it as a process of nature. But no, in this, you just have one big fish that's eating everything in the stream and destroying the lives of all the people that live near the stream. So like... It's this really this kind of like corrupting greed that um, yeah, okay. is what yeah. Gunvold represents, which you know, we take it in a very socialist way. Obviously, you can say he's like a he's like a bourgeoisie, he's like an owner, where he wants everything for himself, as opposed to having things being distributed. You yeah, know, I can see that like and and d- d- sowing internal divisions in in the like collective uh, that that he's working against. I I I can see that. But we're definitely getting deep into the themes right here because my counter is like I still I I see what you're saying, hipster, but I, I still see it a bit in a different way because to me the big fish did read as nature, right? Nature is sometimes cruel. Uh, the the main force that we see Grunhard exhibit through the entire uh, movie is number one, wolves and rats. You know, animals of nature scourges and plagues that are real animals that have harmed humanity and you know that humanity has had to build cities and shelter to protect themselves from you know wolves that would kill people and would you know uh ruin their hunt uh, rats that would destroy you know granaries and corn and, and whatever agricultural production and the almost arbitrary randomness of nature to decide that this year there will no be good fish in this river because of whatever reason, right? Like there are yeah. bigger animals. There are threats in nature. Nature and in itself yeah. nature in itself is not in, in, a, in a homeostatic, you know, a stable harmony. Nature is chaos. Nature is catastrophe. And I've, I've got that feeling here because um, while you are right that Grunwald has some kind of association with excess and greed and you know selfishness and individualism in that sense, as as in Grunwald kind of is the rejection of community, it is noteworthy that in the symbolism, in the themes of uh, the story, um, loneliness and division is associated with stasis as well. Um, Hilda has a song that really communicates this idea. So she has this song where she thinks about in the past, in the past, you know, the people prayed to God and God is kind to all of his children. But how is God kind to all of his children, right? Um, Because the otter prayed to God and said, I am afraid of the claws of the brown bears. Can you remove the claws? And God says, okay, yeah, sure. I'll remove the the claws. The brown bears don't have claws anymore, which is a really terrifying and cruel image, right? Like, because... uh, things in nature are naturally in conflict the otters want that the bears don't have any claws anymore and then a small animal prayed to god and says pity my god the otters devour all the fish then god says okay i threw the otters in the fire so there is a notion that nature in itself is you know dangerous violent and if one faction wins out over nature there's always some kind of other part of nature that we throw out the window so um if god you know, um, is intervening and trying to make the world peaceful and prevent suffering. And that is the last stanza of the song is, uh, once upon a time, the Lord God stood and said, sleep well, everyone, all of my dear children. Like sleep well means you don't live, you don't find conflict, but you also don't find pain, you know. Um, And that is only achieved by stasis, by cold, by ice, by being frozen. And I think that's how I tie Grunwald's a relationship with ice and nature into everything here, right? So to live is to burn. To live is to be in conflict. To live is to build community against nature and carve out your place in the world in the in the order of things. You know. Yeah, you, you know, God in that song should really just turn around and, and be like, uh, now, you you better read up on like ecology and food chains." Uh, yeah, <laughs> not, not going to do that, dumbasses. Yeah, um, I, I guess we could say it's, it's a bit of a mixed metaphor. The movie kind of throws it uh, a few ways. But in generally, yeah, I, I can see what you mean there. Because Gunvald, he like, is, again, I, I think the main way, way I think about it is it's like it's a hoarding of life and it's about not wanting anyone else to have a chance to succeed where, where nature is having a chance to succeed. Uh, essentially, we could put it like that. Um, so you're right, the humans have a right to 
hunt big fish that is endangering their fishing village. But like Gunvald just wants to like wipe them all out so that he'll be the only one. He'll be the only one with a chance to survive. Um, but you also, you're right, he kind of represents this more like this primordial coldness because as we said, it's like a, it's a Hokkaido myth originally. So like the idea of a, uh, the idea of it being like the, this winter that is like this deadly, like male, um, maleficent force that is like trying to destroy you. And like you feel like you have to fight against, uh, I can understand as well. Yeah, remember the scene where Hilda, you know, is saving the little bear and the little child by giving them her amulet? Like now you have immortality, escape from this place. Like they're freezing. And then the the wolf spirits like are just cold and they are hitting her and she's like being pummeled by these cold wolf spirits. Like the symbolism is very clear. Like it's ice, it's cold, it's death, it's nature, you know. If you don't have community, if you don't have protection, if you don't have other people looking out for you, you're going to freeze in this world. And I've actually wrote down a little table, like uh, like like <laughs> on my notes, there's a table where I oppose the themes of cold and heat in this movie. On the one side, we have Grunwald, cold, you know, and then we have the human community, heat. Why? Because, you know, the human community has like the sun emblem, which is associated with marriage. Horus is the prince of the sun. He wields the sun sword, you know. There's warmth and spring in this community. There's life. There are friendships. There are families. There's, you know, children and so on. What do we have on the other side? Grunwald's uh, realm is that of wild animals and ice, isolation, survivor's guilt, loneliness, division. People like Hilda who are unwilling to accept the possibility of a happy human life and rather, you know, think it's all meaningless because we're all going to die, who are so afraid of, you know, burning away, and in this sense, literally, right, um, burning away being associated with life itself. If you burn for something, you have passion, you may burn yourself in the, in the fury of it, you know, but it's not stasis. This is why the blacksmith fire is something I put on the table on the side of the human side, because what is it that ultimately slays Gunwald? The fire of the blacksmith, the hammering of the sword, the uh, fusing of iron and steel to finally build a weapon to slay and fend off winter. Industriousness, human creation, you know, the literal fire that humanity uses to mold nature to its own desires is, you know, the weapon humanity wields against the giant ice colossus mammoth, you know. And all of these symbols are really, really intertwined and really interesting. And, you know, we're probably going to touch on them a lot more during our character analysis of Hilda. But that's how I basically look at this movie. It has this very quintessential opposition of cold and heat as sun and ice uh, against each other in every fiber of its, you know, being. Yeah, I th yeah I the think scene with the what... hammers and the forge is like the, the one of the, the shots in the movie where it just goes full like communist propaganda, where it's like <laughs> these these hammers falling in like this big line, and it's like this kind of almost surrealist imagery of just this pure industrialization of this process. Yeah, like co collective work. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get that. Um, what. What, what, one thing I want to say, like part of what makes the the, the story feel like like mythology is like how uh, Gunwald like in part represents nature, like the the dangerous parts of nature. Um, but uh, but his, his actions are all about like uh, he he doesn't just send wild animals and and winter at this village to destroy them. Uh, his first motive is to divide, yes, divide and conquer, but mostly divide. Um, using, you know, uh, using Hilda, using all, all this like uh, distrustfulness, and it's also specifically stated by Horace's father that that's how their yeah. village died was internal uh, uh, to uh, turmoil, um, which in in itself may not uh, like destroy a, a community completely, but it's uh, it's the subsequent inability to deal with harsh nature that that does it. So I I can definitely imagine like traces of 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 this myth that uh, from a like um f from an indigenous communities in like harsh cold winter climates uh, areas that personified some sort of devil of winter as not just like the winter is coming and it is angry at you but but like uh it is preparing to destroy you by dividing you yeah uh and like as greed, long as you instance, are yeah. united when those things come it is not dangerous, but what you most have to look out for yeah. is this, like, uh, 
uh, like yeah turmoil this uh, yeah. division the image i'm getting like mentally to really explain what the kind of themes of this movie are doing is if you huddle together you you can generate enough warmth to survive the winter but if you are divided you will go out alone into the wild and freeze to death you know that's kind of what it's doing yeah i'm, I'm sort of reminded of this this idea that um like the cultural foundations for the uh, Scandinavian welfare states um, might be found in uh, how uh, communities uh, would uh, like respond to these harsh winters through a, uh, a culture of, uh, of collectivization uh, of, uh, of co collectively owned and distributed resources uh, during the course of the winter, um, which uh, like uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of reminded of that when, when looking at, this like utopian vision of a uh, of a community in, in that sort of climate there's this very strong idea that what civilization is you know and we are in in this movie at least historically speaking in very early parts of civilization right like the first human steady settlements who rely on the fruits of nature to even be able to survive in any case like they're not really doing structured agriculture they're like a fishing subsistence kind of village with hunters and fishing and you know whatever gathering and what i'm reminded of is the idea that civilization uh and there's a very potent um way of framing this in uh, the the foreword to my version of Sophocles Antigone, which is like basically explaining how the city-state is seen as a final frontier against the barrenness and, you know, ruthlessness of nature. And that image comes immediately to mind when I see the very first scene of this movie. We open on horrors basically alone having to fight off the wolves. We know this boy has been in the wild. He has been um, one of the sole survivors alongside his father of a previous village who was basically which was destroyed by the wizard and he's just here fending on his own and that makes him kind of stand out because the theme of the movie in general is people need community need, people need to find villages in which they take care of each other you know a theme that for takahara would recur for example in grave of the fireflies as we discussed like the very strong idea that takahara brought into grave of the fireflies was people can't live without community right that was his central theme of the movie um, we have it here as well. Horus kind of stands out, and I think that's a, as good a time as any to talk about like what makes Horus special. Why is he such a, a individual that goes against the grain, right? Like because he was very well able to live alongside his father outside alone in the wild, and he's strong, and he goes and destroys the fish on his lonesome, you know, that the village couldn't destroy together. You know, there's this scene where Horus he is like that someone's father died trying to fight the fish in the village tries to all go together to kill the fish but it's like no 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 that's too dangerous you will all be hurt or something and, and Horus just kills the fish alone right so maybe this is more of me being a bit critical of the film because I don't really understand the young you know upstart hero who solves the problem on his own initially because that seems to be contradicted by the very same movie because Horus realizes he needs everyone to forge the blade together to save the world you know but in the beginning yeah. he's very fine surviving on his own and killing the fish and everything yeah absolutely it's it's sort of like the uh, the, the hero's journey and journey a pr proto shonen protagonist uh like figure uh, being put into like a story that's supposed to be like a, a, about collectivism, which which leads to this like sort of jankiness. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think especially like uh, uh, after like uh, Hilda betrays him and he enters the what we jokingly call the shadow realm, you know, yeah. this, this abstract place where where he's like uh, literally and figuratively lost. And it's supposed to be this like belly of the whale moment. If to uh, once again quote uh, Joseph Campbell. Um, where and, and he has this realization that 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 is very important that oh we need to forge the sword together, but there's nothing really like in the story that like really leads there like it it, it just sort of happens uh, and and it's that realization isn't is barely even like related to his anguish about Hilda being like uh, duplicitous, um, so it's yeah there, 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 there's there's a lot of like uh, jankiness and even in the narrative structure. Um, I don't know. I, I think the story does like a a, a job with um. N maybe it doesn't like foreshadow it, and like it's not like Horus shows this development. But I think the movie at several points critically shows that Horus, even though he's quite strong, he's quite a able, 
he still can't take on the whole world by himself because if we think about in the opening scene, he's getting chased by wolves and is only saved by the uh, big giant dude, Mogi, whatever his name is, Rock Boy. Uh, he f- tries to fight uh, Grunwald at a, himself at the beginning of the movie when he first meets him, but he gets thrown off a cliff and almost dies. Uh, and then there's like several other points throughout the movie where Horus will like heedlessly charge in and do pretty well for himself, but still ultimately be defeated by a superior force of like more numbers. Yeah. And so like only by like having the entire village all attack at once can they actually overpower this dude. So I think there kind of is a a, a few seeds dropped within the film that shows that Horus may be like an ultra capable individual of a typical hero's journey. But like in the end, he is saved by the people around him. You know, yeah. you know except I, the pike. The, the pike is just like yeah, he does it, that. It was just a co- too cool a sequence. Yeah, yeah. They, they couldn't, yeah. Uh, like he does one really cool anyway. thing by himself. That's true. But I definitely see your argument. Uh, I because when we think about Horus in the beginning of the film, he's fighting off the wolves on his own, struggling, being saved by the supernatural force. And later we see being wolves being fought again. But now the village are all fighting them. They've built barricades. They've fortified. They're fending off the wolves really capably. And I think that we can see an evolution there almost right like because uh miyazaki tends to have these characters as well but here we have takahara do this prototype of a wild wolf child almost right like okay wolf child may sound contradictory he's fighting the wolves but he grew up alone with his dad in nature kind of like future boy conan who's just like chilling on his island and being like the king of his island yeah and the, the very idea there is that you know what he's doing is he's he he doesn't really grow much right like there's nothing that's gonna happen if you live like that his father on his deathbed kind of regrets says i made a huge mistake i'm a coward i I escaped from civilization but honestly you know people should live in civilization you go you find them see what you can do what cool shit and it turns out that you don't have to fight the wolves every day if you together join build civilization and defeat the wizard who's sending the wolves basically carve out your fortress against the cruel world that you know would seek to destroy you but that is only possible in a community so i guess i do see the development there yeah it makes sense like it's not like uh uh he could have remained as he was in the beginning so there is definitely some kind of arc that he goes through as well even though it is more subtle than i guess hilda's arc yeah i I think what's really missing is like uh the clarity of conflict, like internal and and external. If if his character was about like learning to appreciate, yeah. uh, like the, uh, the collective, then uh, he should have had a harder time integrating into the village. He that maybe maybe a moment where he's like too stubborn to to ask for help or something like that, and, yeah. and him learning the lesson that way. But he's he's just too good of a of, of a guy. Yeah, uh, the the conflict just, is more like they yeah. doubt him, which is a, a bit contradictory in the sense of that we if we want him to change as a character, we expect him to have some kind of mistaken notion about the village, uh, and having his mind change, right? But it's not really, that is not really happening. Like, the village doubts him, which is basically the central conflict of the movie at the end of the day. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's how, like, uh, a part of that is just Hilda being such a, a more layered uh, character with internal and external conflicts uh, interacting with each other. And uh, and even, like, when he, he goes into that, like, Shadow Realm vision quest thing, uh, her, like, uh, betrayal is like uh, front and center, not the question of like forging the blade together with people. That 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 doesn't even come into it, and that's kind of why like the the ending partially feels so rushed because it's just this. Uh, oh, like I realize now because reasons that that we must forge the blade together. Yeah, it does um, fit thematically yeah. because you know Hilda's whole ordeal is I am isolated because I'm a survivor. I don't think I should ever live with people again. I'm lonely. I'm a loner. That's my whole identity. Listen to my emo songs, you know. And it that that makes it kind of fit, but you're right in that it only fits in the thematic level through all of the symbolism the the film uses and it doesn't really tie into Horace's character arc which may as well not exist even though, yeah. you know, Hipster pointed yeah. out correctly that there is a, a relationship there that the movie has been working towards but there is a character arc for Hilda and I think that would be Absolutely, the best point yeah. for us to transition into talking about everything Hilda which is a lot because wow she she's a really compelling and interesting and good and multi-layered character 
Yeah, it's, it's special for like a, a female character in like animation uh, from from way back in this time. It's it's just it it, it it's really really cool watching her like uh, have this like deep internal conflict and this very expressive face that that is just so well animated. The way she will be like. Uh, in like a happy situation with the villagers and have this internal moment of like disassociating or like uh, having this sadness about like the futility of it all and wanting that happiness but rejecting it for herself uh, knowing that like she like the first of all the village is destined to die and she is like sort of forced to uh, to make that happen uh, and her like her her rejecting that like the the nature of herself as she has as she defines it, uh, it, it even in, in the face of like uh, g- giving up her immortality that's so, that that is like a way more compelling like character moment than Horace just like fulfilling his destiny as laid out by the stone giant yeah yeah Hilda sort of takes over as the main character about halfway through the movie and like has almost more screen time for a large portion of it than Horace does and yeah, all Horace does is just be like Hilda this isn't you and her, her being like Though, you you haven't noticed my angst? Yeah. Though, though importantly, uh, it is really important to have a Horus in this movie to pull Hilda in. So maybe, maybe we should take a few steps back and like start at the beginning. Like the timeline for Hilda would be something like, you know, she lives in a village. Uh, the village is in, in some way the wizard Grunwald is sowing dissent between them, you know, is dividing them. And Hilda is the sole survivor. And because she kind of forfeits the idea of ever finding happy human community, Grunwald is like, yeah, you're cool. You get immortality from me now. And she basically, in that sense, resolves to live alone, sit on a branch and sing like the bird that she sings about, right? Like this bird who always sings lonely on the tree branch. And you need a Horus to even break her out of that shell because she's caught in grief, survivor's guilt. She has taken a distance from any sense of wanting to live with human communities because it is all senseless. They will all die anyways. She has experienced this before. She was left alone. She was traumatized. And that's why she can never connect again. But yeah, then, Absolute uh, Duma icon. Yeah. And then someone shows up and says, no, nah, you can live. Come on. I have all this optimism, this energy, this youthful, you know, naivety towards the future. I'll take you. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll figure this out. And I think from the way the movie frames it, Hilda in the beginning is really just hanging out there. She wasn't placed there maliciously to ruin the community. And But Horus finds her and is like taking her there. And in that moment, she becomes susceptible to becoming the corrupting force, right? Like it's not like she was planted there to be brought into the village to destroy it. I think, at least that's not my read. I think there's a genuine moment of let's try to live in this community which fails for Hilda because yeah, she I wanted feels to, dis- um, dissociated from the community. Say there's a quote from Hilda when she first meets Horus that I feel like really defines her personality where she tells Horus, uh, a demon destroyed my home and put a curse on me, which as far as I can kind of tell throughout the rest of the movie isn't true there isn't actually a curse on her per se, as in there's nothing stopping her from taking off the amulet at any time. Definitely. There's like, she's not actually, you know, mystically bound to Grunwald. He just simply like has this kind of, you're right, she, she has this guilt and he gives her this kind of way of avoiding it and this way of like living forever and avoiding the pain of, of losing people and of being around other people. That's, so yeah. she thinks there's a curse on her. She believes herself to be cursed, and even though she probably actually isn't. Yeah, that's because we see at the end of the movie, she even takes off the amulet and she's perfectly fine. Yeah, she doesn't even really believe it for a second. So we get to the idea of stasis here again, right? Like Grunwald is associated with ice, with stasis. Immortality is stasis. Why? Because when uh, Hilda avoids having any contact with humanity, there will never be a future for her in the sense of. When she, and there's this one very impressive scene that we can probably do a very close reading of, which is the scene where a kid pulls her in and says, look, this is the bride. She's going to get married. This is her dress. We do this ritual. We like sew like patterns on her dress. And one day you will also be married. And in one way we can read this. Oh yeah, the movie is doing some trad wife shit and Takahata is a bit traditionalist. And yeah, that's true. But also this represents Hilda being brought to the idea of you could have a future life, you know, passion, burning, love, 
And Hilda is like in stasis mode. She's immortal. She knows everything is in vain. Everything is futile. No, this is impossible. This is not me. Everything will die eventually. It's not worth it to love and live. It is worth it only to remain in this ever-present stasis of loneliness, isolation, and not having a future at all. Uh, and that's how I see the 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 whole how she reacts to the marriage thing, right? Like the idea of future, the idea of community, the idea of forming long-lasting bonds that mean something to her is fucking terrifying because she's like everything that will mean anything to me at any point can be taken from me, will disappear, will fade away. Therefore, it is better to not live at all. Hmm. I remember. Um... I think it was a uh, Jenny Nicholson talking about like how the, the how much Frozen became such an enormous phenomenon for young girls, and and she just pointed out that like it it it's, it's angst like li little girls love fucking angst. It's just they 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 don't get those characters too often, <laughs> and uh and 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 like damn if if, if that is like the defining feature of Hilda, this like uh, deep Definitely. internal conflict and uh, and angstiness and like big emotions that just like steals the the, the movie uh, from right underneath the protagonist absolutely like her, you, i'd yeah. also like to mention how well her animal friends exist as kind of like these elements of her psyche that she literally talks to and kind of has a back and forth yeah the angel and devil of, on her shoulder yeah. yeah yeah very much the angel and devil where the uh, the the squirrel uh chiro i believe the name is here um she kind of the this squirrel kind of functions as Hilda's conscience, kind of like not just her conscience, but kind of like her doubt, where she like um, brings up her her actions against the village, and she's like, you know, you should feel bad for tricking the village. You should feel bad for doing these things because you know that like you wouldn't want this to be done to you. Like you know that people hurt as much as you do. Like you can't deny that. So it's this kind of like sadness this kind of like feelings of guilt and of like responsibility to a community that the squirrel is kind of telling her. Uh, and then uh, the owl is kind of like this, um, this kind of like deep self-preservation instinct to like reject humanity, to reject pain, to reject everyone because you know, they'll only hurt you in the end. So like the owl is this constant like naysayer and he's constantly getting Hilda to try to sabotage the village because he fears, you know, that she'll grow attached to it and will no longer want that, you know, that protection, that will to uh, to avoid pain at all costs. You know, in, in that context, I want to bring up, like, notice how in the scene where Hilda is, like, having a peak crisis and is running away from the town, you know, um, the marriage is heavily associated with the imagery of the sun, right? Like, the door has a sun painted on it, the cloak that the bride is wearing is having a sun painted on it like the the the, the tapestry has sun on, has a sun on it and when the rats arrive they eat this you know this cape or cloak or tapestry or whatever with the sun painted on it so like we understand that hilda kind of called the rats right like we don't know what kind of magic she used but she called the rats that's what she she did like the owl uh you know leading her on and uh it eats the rats eat the fucking cloak as a symbol of, you know, the decay and dying and, you know, uh, uh, how it will all fade, how it is all meaningless in the face of death. Rats in general are like one of the archetypal plagues that, you know, hum that, that represent like the inevitable decay and erosion of everything human. And uh, I just find that all very compelling in this symbolic reading where we op uh, where we put like warmth and uh, cold on opposite sides and we see how heavily the sun is really pulled into this marriage imagery. Well, yeah. also, I think it's interesting though that scene right after the rats attack, the husband and wife who just got married, they are devastated but then the husband picks up the wife. He's like, come on, let me let me take you home. And there's still like love between them. There's still hope. And that's what really sets Hilda off. Like she, this yeah. is when she fully decides to frame Horace and go like evil mode. Because like the idea of going through this great tragedy and having your wedding day ruined, but still just finding simple love and happiness is like an affront to everything Hilda believes about rejecting pain, about rejecting humanity. Because if other people can, you know, just so easily shrug off a trauma like that, then, you know, she's beginning to realize that she's just running away from her problems and she's not uh, as strong as anyone else. 
Yeah. Uh, that's a really interesting reading of it. Uh, I, I also feel like it, it, it taps into some like uh, some some like uh, primal sense of like envy. Like uh, like you, you just imagine this like uh, there's like ancient tribal people having this like thing with like wishing rats upon like the the, the happiness of happy days of others. And then she just like goes and like cast the spell. Like just yeah. I summon rats. Um, that's such an archetypal curse. Like the curse, first thing she actually does against the village. Yeah, it's, it's like the peak curse. It's like archetypal curse, uh, which make which really makes sense if we like view it as oral tradition, right? Like because in oral tradition, curses are always like this really grounded thing. Like it's like rats or sickness or illness spreading from the hay or whatever. You know, it feels like a typical trope of folklore. Yeah, and and again, like tapping into some like some like something deeply deeply human, like uh, so some sometimes like you, uh, especially if, if like Hilda, you you are like so like lonely and in your own head and uh, and unwilling to accept like happiness and help from others. Just the like the joy of others, like in, in the face of that, to just. Get, get, gets those like envious like dark feelings out uh, in and, a way well, and I, I, I think, think that's, it makes that's sense really as cool. well from from her, like a psychological perspective um, Hilda was like a, apparently the lone survivor of this village so she kind of like was not only put into this immense situation of grief but she also had absolutely like no one like to help her process it she had like no way to in any way you know rebuild her life she was completely alone uh, and she, that, she did have like, a squirrel and, a, and an owl. Well, yeah, it's actually not clear how long they've been around because the oh, owl right, seems yeah. to be from Grunwald, like his, you know, emissary. So I don't know if he appeared after or whatever. But and like, and like I said, the, anyway, the, both the animals are more elements of her psyche than they are yeah. actual characters. Just, just to quickly finish off the thoughts about like the folk tale-ness of everything, right? I, I, I've been constantly thinking about like, the songs in this movie especially like when the village is like oh yeah the fish are back they're like yeah yeah the fish are back and everything like like there's a happy song about them like uh, celebrating that the fish are back and celebrating the harvest and then we have the marriage rituals and the marriage songs and so on and I, I i'm just constantly thinking about how like the oldest religions of the world always like seem to center around like fertility cults and like goddesses of fertility and harvest and fishing and so on like stuff like that and it's really brought to the forefront here and also like by the early Iron Age uh, setting, uh, early Stone Age, uh, late Stone Age, whatever, like the transition no, from... No, there's they're steel. There's, uh, there's yeah, there, there is, but uh, also like thing. it definitely is visually more late Stone Age, like early Bronze Age, like discovering how to do metal work in general. That is like the very, very early stuff. Like they have mostly wooden spears with like stone tips, you know, and they have like leather clothes which are like loosely tied together and they are subsistence fishing. I understand that steel and iron is brought into this. I feel like it is brought into the, it mostly to like uh, uh, parallel the Arthurian legend, like the swords on the stone and so on. But I think like locating it in late Stone Age, early Bronze Age is probably more historically sensible, right? Because yeah, yeah. that is what this movie is themes seems to be about: a community living mostly from you know fertility, harvest, fishing praying and singing and praising when nature brings them big bounty when when like the fish are there and i feel this very like primal or primordial human uh, anthropological thing going on here right like really what did the communities of old consider the most meaningful things in the world and it would be winter and the fish being there and fertility and marriage like stuff like that the basic building blocks of early human civilization and the the movie really puts all of those ideas front and center. Yeah. Well, one interesting note is is that uh, like Hilda is specifically lauded for her beautiful singing voice, and that's like part of what makes the villagers charmed by her. But she does not join in in the like chorus. Yeah. Of uh of of, of the, the co collective singing and uh, and 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 her songs don't like. Be, 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 uh, they don't add their chorus to, to her either. Absolutely so excellent observation. Detail. Holy shit! Like I. I, I knew it, but I didn't notice it. You know what I mean? If You pointed it out now. It's like, yeah, fuck. She's always singing alone. And whenever she sings, 
the people stop working and listen to her, but they're not joining in on the singing. Her songs are yeah. songs of sadness and isolation, loneliness, alienation, and so on. And the villagers sing songs of fertility and happiness and love, you know? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's partly why, why I, I jokingly called it the, uh, the the Gargamel Gambit, because like part of her disruption to the village is just that like e everyone's too mesmerized by her songs to work, which is like like a thing, but it doesn't really go anywhere. It's just mentioned as a, as a thing. Just a really interesting like, going about being like, aha, they will be so charmed by this, uh, by this, uh, by uh, my creation that, uh, that they will uh, be easily conquered. Speaking like, of, yeah. so the relationship to Hilda's song that the other characters in the story take is really interesting. Let me just name a few moments, right? The, what we notice first is Horus is immediately enchanted by a song and is like, wow, you sing beautifully. I think we can build a connection. And that's true. The villagers accept her because of her song. But a weird thing happens. When they work and they have these working songs, they sing together, like like, a, like communist collective songs with like a steady beat and everything where they can all sing together and enjoy their work. But when Hilda sings, they stop working. They somehow lose motivation to work. Something seems to upset them it's not really specific right like it's just like some are envious that hilda's getting all this attention like her songs are individualistic they are talking about her feelings how about her sense of alienation and not about like something in of interest to the community so we we make up we open a dichotomy we have the interests of the community which is let's work together let's protect our village and so on and we have hilda who has like deep feelings and the community at the same time resonates with her ideas and is entranced by it but also there's a degree to which she is put at a distance from the community through this degree of individualism but we it goes further when hilda starts really losing her shit and turns like sort of evil like attacking horus and so on what does horus say he says remember your song so instead of seeing the song as a dividing element that pulled her away from the people, he sees it as a very uh, deliberate expression of humanity to try and pull her back towards humanity. So I find it fascinating how Hilda's song at the same time is a disruptive element in this communal, communal sense, but the movie ultimately falls on the side of praising this individualist expression of artistry, you know, of expressing your feelings through art, of, of allowing dark you know, emotions, alienation, depression and whatnot to come through in art and to be appreciated in that way, you know, as something that humanizes the artist rather than being some vain individualist narcissism. Yeah, I, I guess really like just the moment Hilda begins singing like worker songs, uh, they will unlock the true potential of the village and uh, take over the world. Well, it's I not going to happen say, though. Hilda, <laughs> Hilda's truly the opiate of the masses. She really stops them from working. <laughs> Uh, but I was going to say to that, I think the movie also does an interesting inverse um, with Gunvald, uh, where he is this rugged individualist that wants literally the entire planet just to himself. But he also is seeking a family because, as we specifically remember, he's looking for a brother and a sister in Hilda and Horus. So it's 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 very peculiar that he's this guy who's like, I want to live forever. I want to kill all of humanity but also he still wants like a family he's still kind of deeply lonely and he still wants people that ultimately he's like controlling and he's still this domineering figure over but he's still kind of part of him recognizes the need for that like uh, other person yeah and uh and getting back to how like uh when meeting uh hilda and horus like uh, hilda just declares that, like oh we are the same we we're, we're like we're like twins um, and 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 as we later learn, like she already identifies as like the sister of uh, of Grunwald, which is just uh, just really interesting that like she uh, she acknowledges this like we, uh, the two of us we understand each other and and maybe there's like that that is what she's me means by being the sister of Grunwald that that he understands her like uh, nihilistic despair uh, in a way that others don't. Um, um, that, that 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 might be like what's uh, what's being meant. Yeah, I don't know exactly what's meant by it, but again, there is this strange thing where he does seem to like want Hilda with him. Like it's 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 more than that, you know. Like he 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 wants her to help destroy the village, but also there's this kind of you know a longing that he won't necessarily admit, but he's still asking for. I, I think reading Gunvald still as a, as a force of nature, as a, as a a dark side of humanity. 
uh, that in the same way that like in the in, in some like uh, Christian theology that the devil is like within yes. all of us, uh, Grunwald is that impulse to despair, to give up, to uh, to not find meaning and to divide to, to distrust, against ourselves. To fight yeah. amongst each other and so on. I think how we should understand Grunwald is he wants allies because, you know, how does the idea that humans will always, you know, sow division manifest itself in the real world? Well, by humans who, you know, out of fear or anxiety or whatever, start dividing people, you know, who deceive, who betray, who backstab and so on. And I think he needs people who in, 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 in inhibit the, uh, inhabit these traits or exhibit yeah. these traits uh, in order to be confirmed that his theory is correct. So we need to understand that his means of destroying communities is not just magic throwing winter and wolves and giant ice mammoth at them, but it starts with, you know, making them fight amongst each other, making them expel each other, you know, that is what we see in the movie. Yeah. The, yeah, because it fair, also maybe, kind of maybe, proves uh, his thing. Yeah. Like, he wants to believe the worst in people and he wants to believe that humans won't get on together. And so by, like, constantly trying to make that happen and fueling it, he's, like, proving it to himself in the same way Hilda is constantly trying to uh, distance herself from the village to prove that she was never welcome in the first place. Hmm. Uh, also, to, to be fair, if I was in Gunwald's shoes and my goal was to destroy a village, I, I would probably try the giant ice mammoth first. That thing, that thing is pretty destructive. Like you know, to like, uh, I mean, no, no, uh, no offense to like the uh, uh, the potential darkness you can tap into from the human heart, but like giant ice mammoths, like they 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 compete. They're... But yeah, um, just to continue the character arc of Hilda, right? Like, so we have her turn nasty. She brings the village into a little bit of chaos. She makes it so that Horus is expelled, she throws him into the Shadow Realm. And yeah. then she sort of has this moment, uh, or, or I think she has this moment actually before she throws Horus into the Shadow Realm, where a child comes up to her and says, you know, sing your, sing your song for us. And she can't sing. And I, I was thinking about that scene because she's very aware of what her songs are about. Because in that moment, she's experiencing a warm and pleasant scene with that child, right? Who's like trusting her and she's like, I can't sing. And the child sleeps. And she, in that moment, she resolves, I want to spare this child. And the two animals say, you know, what use would that be if you spare this child? Don't you know that if you spare just this child, what you will cause is another Hilda, another survivor, another lone survivor, survivor's guilt, community taken from her. That is not good for her. Like, if you spare her, that's actually not doing her any favors. And I think that is the very thing that throws her into crisis because it shows how she is divided too. Now, zoom forward into the Shadow Realm, we see horrors like encountering multiple, multiple versions of Hilda, like, like shadowy or like holographic, like copies of her, you know, who have all like different doubts and anxieties about the world. And um, the, this, this, this like clone army of Hilda says like, Hilda only divides people. I'm only ruining people. I only cause discontent and distress and I make good people turn into bad people basically and Horus yells at her and says you are divided too like you in yourself have two conflicting desires he says it like the bad side of Hilda and the good side of Hilda and I think yeah, yeah. this is like one of the best best symbolic ways to express what a complicated character Hilda is like she literally has multiple faces multiple conflicting desires pushing and pulling on her tugging on her and Horus as a character is necessary in the story because he's such a naive straightforward optimist that he's there to yell at her when she says that when she, when she has conflicted desires and to tell her you have conflicted desires that is very human we can work together to make it so you know you can exist in a community and I think yeah, that, that is what concludes that's... Hilda's arc right like she basically really realizes that through this insistence of Horus, who breaks out of the spell, out of the Shadow Realm, and comes to her and tells her, you, we can we can help you. We can make yeah, it that, so that really this is works. the best side of Horus as, as a proto-shonen pr protagonist. That, that, yeah. That's, the, that's the, the goodness and coolness of that character archetype is how uh, often it, it, it is like uh, this, this like uh, extremely optimistic uh strong-willed uh person uh, uh sometimes thrown into like really complicated situations but like get, getting out of it by like in insisting on like these like really simple truths and, and yeah. simple goodness uh you know like uh you know sh sh shout out to luffy from one piece like he he, he would have uh like done the same thing 
talking, uh, croaking in the pirates. <laughs> uh, I was going to say also, yeah, that scene where she tries to save the child, the, that's what I was getting at earlier with like the squirrel and the owl being these kind of two ends of her psyche. I, th- I did think it was very interesting that the compassionate, like loving squirrel is the one that tells Hilda, you're stupid for just trying to save the one child. Because again, like I said, it's kind of more her doubts and her consciousness, conscience at the same time, where it's like, you're being selfish by just trying to save one person because you're right, they're just going to end up miserable. Like, you can rather, you know, try to save everyone, you can try to save the collective, or you can, like, leave them behind. But, like, don't, just don't, trying don't to selfishly save, it, like, one person is kind of like, uh, you're not really understanding the effect you have on other people. You're just thinking about yourself still. Yeah. Like, even through trying to just save one person, you're just doing it for yourself. Yeah. And... You know, now I kind of want to bring together all of these themes with the sword and the stone. Because, you know, the sun sword feels like such an extrinsic element almost. It's like they throw it in at the beginning. He kind of has it in the back of his mind. Like it's Chekhov's gun. It's just lying there. We're waiting for it to do something. And then at the end, he's like, oh, shit, wait, I can reforge this. Let's go. Uh, I think thematically it makes a lot of sense, even though narratively it is a little bit clumsy, right? Like, because let's start. Where does he get it from? Well, it's stuck in the massive stone golem. The massive stone golem, Mog, and he's like, yeah, I have a splinter. It's like kind of fucked up, but you know, whatever. And let's think about that. Like it's a sword like forged by humanity stuck in like this embodiment of pure nature. And the the, the, the the golem promises him, I'll help you if you can pull out the sword. If you can somehow mend the rift or create a harmony between nature and humanity right like in a certain way like we f- we spend a lot of the movie fighting off nature like the wolves the cold the evil fish and whatnot but here in the very beginning and in the very end the very embodiment of nature living rock you know the sword from the stone obviously recalls the arthurian legends but there it is a dead stone right like he's just pulling it from a stone here it is pulled from a living rock and i think that represents a different relationship to nature in the sense of um The boy pulls the sword, that makes him the prince, he's kind of chosen by this magical sword to be royalty, you know, but in a way that symbolically, you know, removes a splinter from nature and allows humanity to live in a a different way. That is the sword of the sun, so something that embraces life, something that embraces a different view of nature, because nature is not just cold, nature is not just wolves and ice and death and stasis, nature is also, you know, fish and marriage and fertility and children and, you know, burning with passion and love. And the moment that we turn around and Hilda also realizes this message. You know, he yells, Hilda, you're divided too. And Hilda realizes she's divided. She gives up her immortality to save another person. She is willing to die in that moment to ensure someone else can live. The purest expression of love, right? That is, I think, the parallel where uh, uh, Horus also learns that, yes, by choosing community to give up something for someone else by working together, that is how we reimbue the sun sword this is how we create the natural harmony this is how we own you know, uh, earn you know uh, our right to exist against these threats in nature these threats in the world you can't make the sword alone you need people to look out for each other you need unity of the workers <laughs> yeah and I, I that's think, how i, I see think... a parallelity between these yeah. two major you know the through lines of the movie one being you know horus and the sword and one being hilda and her own doubts I think there's a version of this movie where the like really powerful imagery, which which you talk about there, with a like a sword being pulled out of a stone giant that represents nature, uh, and this rusted sword being reforged and used for good, uh, where that like uh, fits together a, a yeah. bit better, like that, because it it is like a really striking idea and image, and and and, th- and this movie has a, has a bunch of those, uh, but. Uh, but but once again, like similar to like uh, some of the some of the animation, some of the voice work, some of the just general production being uneven. That there's also that unevenness to the uh, to the story, where it has these elements that are really like evocative, uh, and these that like uh, harken back to, to like uh, to like myth in in like a very uh, very true sense. Uh, but but also has has this like just just this stone giant that like uh, just. Uh, it's like, oh, those wolves. There's they, 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 some some shithead that sent those. You know, uh, I'll 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 see you later. I, I I'm I'm gonna be a Chekhov's gun. Bye. And uh, and he does return, 
exactly when he says, and that yeah. that's just what happened. <laughs> True. Sometimes, sometimes it's just like th they thought it would be cool, and it was cool. It was a very early kaiju fight. Um, yeah. Okay, I say very early. Obviously, all the Godzilla movies already existed at this point, so it's just a kaiju fight, not an early one, and a kaiju fight. Yeah, do you think the original, like, uh, thousands of year old oral tradition had a fight between a big rock guy and, like, an 80 foot tall ice mammoth? Definitely that, fucking not. That would have been pretty sick. <laughs> that would have been pretty cool as a myth. If, if, if it did, then, like, the, 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 the then th that just makes, like, the, the, uh, the, the crimes of the Japanese government even worse. Yeah, just definitely. Like, by a slight degree. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But still. <laughs> they just stole Tokusatsu on top of all of the land of Hokkaido. <laughs> The Ainu people <laughs> were the original kaiju culture. <laughs> Amazing. So yeah, I, I think I think earlier before we started this podcast, Platon, you were like uh, feeling like ah, this this movie isn't really about like unionism or socialism. And I feel like we could bring this discussion in here now, unless yeah. Uh, well, it's 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 not a it's not a hill I want to die on. It's just like there there definitely are these like strong themes of like uh, uh, co co the collective and, and and you know social cohesion and uh, and and working together, uh, and and this you you utopic uh, primitive like uh, primitivism and uh, and stuff. It's just that, like, uh, socialism is, like, built on a lot of these, like, uh, ideas and is related to it. But just, like, I don't think it's specifically, like, uh, I, I don't, for example, see, like, much of a class struggle, which is, like, very core to, to like, socialism as an idea. It, there, um, there, I, so. I, I will agree right there. Like, there is nothing there. It is, I think... Uh, the only thing I yeah. can think of is, like, the, the village chief guy is kind of this, like, you know, hapless leader who, like, positions himself as the chief. But he's more of kind of, like, this just jumped-up guy with no real authority. And there's a scene where, like, they try to... They, they tear down the barn to protect the whole village from the um, wolves. And he's like, no, that's my barn. You can't, like, touch my shit. Yeah. Which, I don't know if there's necessarily a class thing, but it is certainly... There's, like, parts of the film where it feels like maybe there's, like, this, this idea of, like, this ownership where it's, like, the village is literally about to be overrun and destroyed, but this guy's worrying about his own shit. I, I think an, an important way to look at this is that class is just one way that, you know, the economic system of capitalism manifests itself. Like, the principles of, you know, collectivism versus individualism and greed versus solidarity and so on, they're not limited to one particular incarnation of a, any given economic system, right? Like, obviously, the movie has subsistence farming uh, or, like, subsistence fishing in this sense, and the wizard isn't really shown to be any economic force whatsoever. He just, you know, ruins shit and sends catastrophes. So it... Definitely makes sense if you point out there's no class dimension to this. But what there is, is the idea of the people united against, you know, an oppressive force is the only way, you know, to move forward. Like only if you unite people and you, you do collective work and collective action can you, you know, win the struggle. Which is why, especially in the historical background of this movie being a production by unionists during the student protest time, you know, gives it this really evocative uh, sense of time. You know, it, it is of a certain time where protest and, uh, you know, uh, dissent and revolution and unionism was on everyone's mind. And therefore, themes of these ideas made it into the movie, even if, you know, there's not literally a proletariat being, you know, uh, sent uh, to wage war against a bourgeois, which I think, honestly, isn't really necessary to have, like, socialist-like themes in a movie. Like, it's like... Okay. In that case, we get the, the argument becomes semantic. It's just, uh, like, because I, I agree on all of those themes. And, one, okay. and once again, like, a lot of the thematic stuff going on it, like is is uh, things that underpin and are related to uh, socialist ideas. And it is n worth noting that they use explicitly socialist imagery, like Soviet-style shit, like with all the hammers hitting the sword, and it's like, yeah, we are like the hammering proletariat. Like, these images are in there, definitely during the Shadow Realm sequence, when he's like, oh yeah, let's reforge the sword. Yeah, also truly, um, the movie has all these big sequences that it doesn't quite pull off. But it's it's really a film that was all about like ambition and like trying to do something like great and then kind of failing at it. And what's more socialist than that, truly? <laughs> <laughs> like, 
like true and yeah. to add insult to injury uh, uh i don't know that's probably not the right expression but i read an anecdote where uh, yasuda was talking about how miyazaki was always working on this film while singing russian worker songs to himself so that's how we need to imagine this being made <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Like it, the context of it is is, is like uh, it clearly placed into those themes in very interesting ways. Man, what a what a larper Miyazaki was. <laughs> Definitely, and I think that's yeah. why he cringes when he remembers this movie and doesn't want to talk about it because obviously, like, this is the kind of movie made by like a dark, bleeding heart socialist who sings workers songs to himself and believes the world revolution is going to come and everyone is going to be red and all the workers will be united and then Miyazaki obviously became a much more cosmopolitan much more aware individual who like kind of fell out with like orthodox Marxism in that sense even though he had like faith in like the young generation and he was remaining critical of the you know Americanization of Japan and the American occupation and the military bases and war and nationalism and all of that like Miyazaki always remained a progressive but he became a let's say more enlightened progressive when he like ditched or like fell out with this really intense rah-rah socialism that we can really feel all over this movie yeah and i like just uh today we look back on this movie as like uh once again like the the uh the way back like origins of uh, of the collaboration between uh takahara and, uh, and miyasaki what would lead to uh, studio ghibli uh, the studio that would like uh, overshadow like e- even the uh the icons that they of animation that they worshiped at the time yeah um but like but for probably for for, for the people working on it themselves it, it, it's probably back on this like we thought we were about to like change the industry for, forever and like uh and to, like and for the better and make this masterpiece and uh, and instead it got like uh shafted by the studio become a, became a financial disappointment and I, lo- and I lost my job and that, that, yeah. that's Probably. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it is, that's how it is telling they never made a movie as uh, idealistic as this again. Though it is worth noting that even though there was only like a 12-day theatrical release before the movie was pulled from theaters, it was apparently very well received by the student protesters at the time who thought it was very emblematic of their struggle. Yeah, it, it, it obviously like would, would, had, uh, would have had its fans at the time. And, uh, and, we, and we've even... Uh, uh, quoted this uh, like uh, western like response to it with like uh, those that saw it being like holy shit something's going on in Japan uh, so, so definitely like it, it had something there I'm just talking about from like from, from a career perspective as someone yeah. like working in the industry looking back at this sort of project I, I absolutely understand that uh, that uh, c- that like cringing uh, which is basically what, what uh, Miyazaki has said he <laughs> thinks about it yeah it's sort of um you know, it, it sort of reminds me of uh, the story behind uh, One from the Heart by uh, by Francis Ford Coppola, where like uh, after being like at the height of his power in, in like the 70s, he wanted, he created this movie studio and it was going to change Hollywood forever. And it was going to be more collaborative and like the uh, like uh, cast and crew would like uh, co-own much more of the production. And, uh, and, and they were like going to like, uh, like, they made all these sorts of like uh, wild uh, swings in the like visual department and uh, and and this like really big movie that went way over budget and over schedule and didn't sell any tickets and uh, and uh, Coppola has like been paying off that debt ever since uh, by being like basically a workman director in many ways. What and, a fucking sad story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, it is. It is a sad story, but like it's also like you have to like. You have to admire and respect, like just swinging for the fences, even if, like the uh, the people involved might look back on it with like more more cringiness than uh, than optimism. Oh yeah. Um, and, and another another project it sort of reminded me of was um, uh, some of the behind the scenes stories about like Pocahontas in uh, in, in Disney, which was also like uh, this like conceived as this like really. Uh, in, enormously like ambitious work, uh, like they, they were apparently like supposed to be like actually have like native speaking dialogue instead of just uh, all being in English and like uh, a, a lot of stuff. And then eventually, with like uh, with the production go, uh, going a bit too long and the studio getting involved, and uh, you know, it became what what it is uh, known as today, which is just like this weird mix of like this. Uh, Colon- like weird colonial vision and talking animals. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, uh, 
one, one too many talking animals in this movie for for, for my taste. Yeah, like, fuck like, the bear. I, I, yeah. It's useless. Yeah, the, 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 the bear, best is yeah. annoying. Like it, it sort of reminds me. I've, I I watched. I finished watching uh, the original like Gundam seventeen uh, like uh, seventy nine uh, anime. And uh, which has a similar like tonal thing where like it it has this maturity and action, and also just this this gang of like uh, of like bratty like uh, comic relief kids and a robot sidekick just out to the side, just occasionally yeah like busting into the story and 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 their character designs are a bit like out of step with the rest. Um, I guess that's just like part of. Part of the, you the need a marketable part, part mascot the, uh, at medium. that time. Yeah, you, I think you have, yeah. you they have couldn't to get watch. Uh, you have to watch Araka Seven now because that is that takes those exact three child characters and tries to make them real people uh, and like rehabilitate the image of them. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> yeah, uh, 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 this was the the, the the child characters like uh, Flip and Mauni. I, th- I think are the, they're like the named ones. Their the character designs are, I feel a bit weird because like they uh, they don't have any white in their eyes. Yeah, they're like they, they beady eyed, like uh, weird like, fucking things. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> with like extremely whiny noises as voices. It's it's bizarre. Like they don't sound like children. Yeah, like they the, sound like the, there's, old there's women like, going like really high pitched, which is probably what yeah. it is. There's also a contrast with like uh, Hilda's like face character design and and the villagers just being like so different. Yeah, which which like which works, you know, because Hilda is like a special character in the movie, but uh, but but still like there there is still like that designed by committee feeling uh, that uh, that. But designed ha- by committee charm, in a different honestly. way, not by like the yeah. shadowy cabal of elites uh, producers. Okay, designed by commune. That's but designed by commune, comrade. That's what we yeah. did. I'd be uh, b- before we uh, we get to wrapping up. Like uh, there's there's a, f- a few like really standout uh, moments that uh, in the movie that I want to highlight we haven't mentioned before. Um, mostly like a couple of small ones. There's um, very early in the movie when uh, I think it's around when, when Horace is like arriving back to his his home to find his father. There's this shot of like these uh, seabirds like flying away as he runs past them. That is just amazingly well animated. Like it, it is like, you know, put 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 Disney to shame. Fluid, believable animal motion, and it's just a brief second, like brief second clip. It it it, it just like made me pause every time I I watched it. Um, also, um, I really love the uh, color choice of um, the uh, the the funeral scene when he uh, when when Horace arrives at, at the village and. Uh, uh, and and the, and the warrior who died to the pike is like uh, uh, the, it, everyone is out there mourning, and it's all like this like really harsh like um, this, uh, soft and sad blue that just takes over the entire like uh, frame, just really uh, like really good stuff. Um, the we, we've we've described it a bit, but like the moment where Hilda like pulls out the dagger and like betrays um, Horus and kills him slash sends him to the shadow realm there's this moment where like the sky behind them just like falls away and turns into this abstract like uh chaotic thing uh and 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 then the like cliffs below them like move away and they're like animated to still like look like background uh like really textured it's it's really like it like unreal um and uh, and and really like sells this like sh- complete shift in in what 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 is happening? Uh, yeah, it was very really cool. space yeah. adventure Cobra the movie. Uh, <laughs> Damn deep cuts here. Yeah, um, yeah. Also, one um, uh, w- one moment that stood out to me. Um, there's uh, when uh, Gunvald like dis- uh, decides now it's time to destroy the village, and there's this shot of like his like uh, enormous looming figure in the distance, like uh, unleashing the like snow. And like the way that is presented and like animated, it it feels like it must be like inspired by like uh, uh, Fantasia, the, the like Devil on the Mountain sequence near the end of that uh, that film. Um, just it, it it just gave me that vibe with with the way he like moves his like in, enormous limb and an enormous cloak around and uh, and just looms over everything. It's uh, just really neat. Also. Remember when the giant ice mammoth, which is also pretty already pretty metal, opens its mouth and then in its entire body turns into a giant maw as it fights against the, the stone giant? That yeah. was 
cool as shit. The gaping <laughs> like, mammoth. Yeah, what the hell? That was nuts. Uh, my, yeah. my favorite moment was where Gunwald tries to throw Horus off the cliff and he throws his axe back at him, but the Horus immediately like swings it around to try to take his head off. Like, absolutely doesn't even flinch. Just full murder mode instantly. Hell yeah. Uh, really, really cool. Actually, really good, like, little fight animations that Horus has throughout. Like, yeah. the use of the axe on the string, really cool. It, it has this, like, like... genuinely inventive. It, it, it has this, like, um, movement style that, like... Uh, it's, it's also there in, like, Future Boy Conan, where, like, the... Like, everything is, like, moving really quickly and accelerating really quickly in a way that, like... It's there's a lot of fighting and a lot of motion, but like the impacts aren't as like emphasized as they might be in like more modern animation. It's it's, mm. it's really interesting. I uh, won't say it's better or worse, but like it's uh, it's it's interesting. Uh, I, I, th- I think that I think that's uh, that, that, that's all I got. Like uh, like men- like I mentioned earlier, there are some like moments of like truly like inspired uh, virtuosic animation uh, cuts and like directing choices that that really just like. Uh, stand like stand out from the rest, like really pop out, um, which which is also the case for like uh, a lot of Ghibli stuff, but um, but but with with much more like uh, like tightly controlled productions and 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 time and care, the the consistency um, like uh, stylistically and quality wise of uh, of like Ghibli movies are like a step above this and uh, and and. It, it, it has it has aged in many ways. Um, one must admit, and while I like I enjoy it, and especially like uh, liked watching it for those standout parts, uh, uh, Horus, uh, the 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 adventures of Horus, Prince of the Sun, which is like I think it's real translated title, um, is like yeah, th- th- there's an element, there's a degree to which. Um, the distinction between appreciation and enjoyment uh, comes in, especially when it comes to like really old movies, really, um, really uh, old media that has been very influential, but is still like a product of a, a time where like the technology or the technique or the budget just wasn't quite there. But so, so yeah, that, that's that's my like. Uh, my take on my, my my brief review of Horus Prince of the Sun. I appreciate it in a in, in a lot of ways uh, more than I enjoy it, but th- that that yeah, doesn't yeah. make it bad. I, I think I feel exactly the same way. Uh, it has great historical value. I find some of its themes and some of its complexities really fascinating and stand out for its time. But uh, the experience of actually watching it at times is really confusing and off-putting uh, because of its weird narrative structure and its many many quirky flaws and its advanced storytelling which is perhaps the weirdest thing of all because it feels like parts of the movie are not cleanly separated in, into like chapters but they're always like in a flow from you know horrors running somewhere after something and randomly stumbling into the next scene you know um but aside from that you know it, really impressive movie really impressive start to uh really impressive careers that's my takeaway here uh same Good, good time. <laughs> yeah, okay. One, one, yeah. What, what, I guess one wonders, like, if, uh, if, if, if there are like other movies like like this with uh, with, with these sorts of qualities that uh, that aren't half as remembered because the uh, the uh, staff uh, didn't really go on to make much else. But, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure yeah. there are, and the situation for us in the West, unfortunately, is such that you know, even some shows Takahata made aren't even like available translated subtitled for us like I know the 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 tv show for Yaren Kuchia which is like a 40-ish episode show that Takahata directed in the 80s uh, is not available subtitled there's a movie that is available subtitled a movie that we will probably cover at some point uh, because it's relatively self-contained I've seen it before it's interesting Um, but it is such a shame that a lot of old anime is not really made accessible and especially the 60s and 70s are uh, spotty at best even though you know honestly there isn't that much anime production at the time compared to 80s 90s 2000s and so on like where anime production kept increasing almost exponentially in terms of uh, how many anime were released every every year um so a lot of this history is probably you know hidden from us even though you know 
we may be lucky and find a translated hidden gem here or there. But, you know, it's it's rough. It's rough out there. It's really hard yeah. to find good 60s anime. Film, uh, film preservation is, uh, is important. Um, and... Uh, how, uh, however, whatever shape that uh, that takes, uh, it's worth supporting. Uh, on the topic of film preservation, it, it bears mentioning that, to my knowledge, I think Horror's Prince of the Sun only has one like British DVD release, and that's about it for the Western release. Got a Blu-ray could... release in twenty thirteen or something. It, Western. Yeah, uh, uh, American Blu-ray release, I think. Okay, then then I'm wrong, uh, and it is preserved pretty well even for the West, but like. I read some articles that may have been older that were referring to like obscure DVD release releases at best. But I think there's yeah. something about like in Britain they don't have an official uh, release. Okay, I see uh, here there was a, a Blu-ray uh, in Region A uh, in 2017. And 2017. That's okay, that's yeah, way more recent. Than I but it took a long time to get here, so that is definitely something worth noting. Yeah. Well, hopefully we've done something here to uh, to like uh, preserve at least discussion of it uh yeah definitely it's, uh, it's, looking it's, it's on youtube i don't think i found a podcast discussing this movie but it could just be that i didn't search thoroughly enough you're, so. you're, you're now listening to the best horace prince of the sun podcast in existence yes <laughs> or rather you're now listening to us transitioning towards the outro because that is definitely where we are going now yeah but. so Next up, uh, Panda Go Panda? Exactly. Panda so, Go Panda. Exactly. So go Panda Go Panda. Panda Go Panda. Uh, that is... The, uh, the proto-Totoro. The p- <laughs> it's, also known. it's such a funny phrase. Proto-Totoro. Yeah, Panda Go Panda, the proto-Totoro. Um, it is uh, it's, uh, two little short films, you know, for children, um, directed by... Oh my God, I'm blanking. Is it Miyazaki himself or did... Takahata also No, directed. Takahata directed it, yeah. but Miyazaki wrote the script and yeah. I believe storyboards. Yeah, because if you even Google Panda Ka Panda, you will find a picture of Panda, of, of, of Papa Panda, which is like the big panda. And he looks like Totoro and he has the Totoro smile. So like, you know, Miyazaki painted this. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really it, it really is my go-to proto-Totoro. Yes. <laughs> Okay, well, you can subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcasting app on YouTube, or you can pitch us a few uh, uh, monies on Patreon so we can continue paying for the hosting costs involved with this podcast. And then you will not miss our next episode on Panda Copanda, where we will be tackling, you know, a really uh, short and sweet, uh, dedicated, like, uh, series of children's short films, which I'm not sure if we can get two hours of discussion out of it, but uh, we're going to do our best to bloat it and fill it with extraneous academic nonsense like we always do. So stay tuned for that. And uh, if you want to, you know, yell at us how stupid our takes are or that socialism is dumb, please join our Discord server. Uh, Some good discussion is also appreciated. But hey, we invite you to have more discussion, more talk on there. And we would love to see you there. And until then, um, uh, uh, see you next time. Yeah, and, uh, and remember, kids, uh, if uh, if if an uh, uh, ice devil uh, uh, arrives in front of you and offers you uh, immortality, just say no. Just say no, kids. Just turn him down yeah. and swig an axe into his face. Yeah. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> All right, everybody. All right, bye. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>